Hal Barwood, welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. It's not every day that I have the opportunity to interview someone who started as a Hollywood writer, transitioned into a computer game writer, and then became a successful author, with each career being equally lucrative. Well, uh, I wish that were true. <laughs> My literary career that's the, the most recent thing, and I'm still in the middle of it, um, hasn't quite produced the revenue that my video and Hollywood careers did. Doesn't make it any less lucrative. I, I, you know, in terms of satisfaction, it's the thing I've enjoyed the most doing. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, after, after working in Hollywood, where you're collaborating with literally dozens of people when you're making a movie, and uh, certainly in my case, I was collaborating most of the time with another writer, Matthew Robbins, when we wrote our screenplays together. And in the case of video games, um, you know, you can't build them without a, uh, and the kinds of games you were making at LucasArts, you can't build them without a team of starting out in the old days, 35 people, but 75, 80 or so toward the end. And um, one of the nice things about uh, writing a book is that it's about the only thing you can do. You can just produce finished goods on your own. Exactly. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. What specific circumstances led to your initial entry into the film industry? Well, um, it goes way back. Uh, I grew up in a little town in New England uh, called Hanover, New Hampshire. And it's the home of Dartmouth College. And uh, my father ran the local movie theater and the um, films that he chose to present to everybody in that little town were um, gauged for the audience of professors and doctors. There was a big hospital there as well as Dartmouth College, but to an uh, educated audience. And so we, I, I got to see when I was a kid, all these wonderful movies, Citizen Kane and Red River and The Thing from Another World. And, but mostly um, it's kind of classy movies, you know, um, stuff like that. Um, uh, uh, Smiles of a Summer Night, you know, Bergman, Bergman movies and so forth. And uh, when I wanted to go see a Tim Holt Western or a Roy Rogers, I had to get my friend next door, his father, to drive the two of us down to Lebanon, New Hampshire, where they played the, the, the cheap movies that were fun for kids. But I was exposed to you know, endless movies um, night and day was from an early age. And when I was at uh, Brown University and the School of Design, Rhode Island School of Design, in Providence, um, I, I kind of finished my major at uh, the beginning of my sophomore year, really, and um, started doing a lot of independent studies. And eventually, I was uh, starting to do, I got very interested in animation. I was an art major. And uh, so I, I wanted to um, kind of get my chops uh, together a little bit better than I'd been doing. And so I I did a, a, an animated uh, independent studies program at Brown. Brown is very famous for having a sort of radical curricula and it was easy for me to you know, do these things with various teachers. And my advisor, uh, uh, when I was building a, a, a movie, a little animated movie in my senior year at Brown, um, knew that I wanted to get into movies and, and um, said, you know, I know this guy, James Ivory. He knew him through these little movies he'd made about Indian miniatures. And James Ivory eventually, of course, became a feature film director. And he said, you know, he studied movies out there at this strange school in L.A., uh, University of Southern California. So I applied to Southern Cal University of Southern California, and I got myself a fellowship there. That, that in those days, they were so eager to have students that they, they didn't bother to find out if you actually knew anything about, you know, uh, creative effort and and uh, did you have any talent or anything like that? I just had a terrific academic record. So I wound up in California. I, I married my childhood sweetheart on the just before we all took off and got in a car and drove to our new life on the West Coast. Um, and uh, so movies were a, a passion for me. Animation was a passion, but eventually, as I came out of uh, school, I did animated movies, a student film. They're, they're kind of famous. I won a couple of awards, National Student Film Festival Awards, stuff like that for my animated movies. But you have to remember, this is back in the days when the, the kind of the eight old men who were the behind the scenes doing all the terrific Disney movies were starting to you know get beyond themselves and the studios was, was faltering and animation was not something that was... Uh, producing hit movies. 
and the and opportunities for employment were very, very small. Uh, it was a complete reversal once um, Pixar got going with 3D animation. And that changed everything. And now almost uh, or every year, some of the very biggest hits, either the very biggest or some of the very biggest hits are animated movies. Probably if I were doing this all again today, I would still be an animator somewhere, you know, doing that sort of thing. But instead, um, uh, I, I, I kind of went through USC in two phases. I was there and starting in 1963, and there were about 30 kids there who wanted to get a degree in movies. And most of them still wanted to do, you know, you know, people who wanted to be creative, wanted to write great American novels. But uh, uh, I spent a couple of years studying. And then I went off and I um, was working for a company called Graphic Films. One of my teachers, Lester Novros, uh, had a, a course there called Filmic Expression, which is the most interesting creative course at USC at the time. And uh, he hired me to, to, to kind of be an animator, his actual company. And so I spent a couple of years doing that, but I was also still working on another graduate school project and a, a big movie for, for me, an animated movie. It was going to be six minutes long and all that, which is a lot of work for one guy. And um, so I, I, I wandered back to film school and, and I became a, te uh, a teaching assistant in the animation department. But then the guy who was the actual teacher and my teacher, um, a guy named Herb Kossauer, suddenly developed pancreatic cancer and expired almost immediately. And I suddenly became the animation teacher at USC. And uh, I, I, I was there for a couple of years, but now I suddenly met another crew of young kids coming to graduate school or undergraduate school. And among them were Walter Murch and Robert Dalva and John Milius and uh, George Lucas. And so these kind of, these kind of, and uh, uh, these kind of guys, Matthew Robbins particularly, became kind of my movie friends and, and my second kind of stint down there. And Matthew and I just found ourselves in these endless conversations uh, talking about uh, movies we'd like to see and then how we would write them and so on. And we became writing partners. We got very lucky. Um, we learned from John Milius that uh, there was a young pup agent at ICM, it was called CMA in those days, but ICM. Uh, and he was instructed by his uh, seniors to go, you know, line up some young talent. And John Milius became a client of that of this guy, uh, Jeff Berg. And uh, Jeff asked John, hey, do you know anybody else who, who might want to do this kind of thing? And he said, yeah, Matthew Robbins and uh, Hal Barwood. And so we suddenly had an agent and we hadn't written anything. <laughs> and so and then we also knew Francis Coppola, who was over at UCLA and, and had started, you know, a, a couple of years ahead of us. And he was doing stuff. So we, we kind of teamed up with him and we got a development deal at uh, Warner Brothers to write a movie. And that was the first thing we ever wrote. And it was a big learning experience, a learning curve like a rocket taking off you know, for us. Uh, I never took a writing course. You know, I took a lot of other courses, but I never took a creative writing course. And um, so suddenly we're, we're screenwriters. Um, we wrote seven screenplays. We got paid for all these things, by the way. Um, uh, but finally, number eight got made. That was the Sugar Land Express. We uh, made acquaintances with uh, Steven Spielberg, and he had this idea for uh, a kidnapping of a policeman down in Texas. And uh, we put together a story based on that idea for him. And that movie got made. That was our first big success. Now let's flash forward, uh, you know, a few years um, where Matthew and I are writing other movies and we sort of got some of them going. Uh, Corvette Summer, which is a terrible title for a movie that we called Stingray. And, and um, uh oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call and I can't take it. Hold on, that's okay. Um, anyway, um, so eventually, uh, we, 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 we were aware of the tremendous success of Star Wars, of course, but we, we wanted to do something commercial. And, uh, uh, but we thought we've got to steer clear of just ordinary science fiction. So we thought about fantasy. And I've been a big fan of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and, and um, Farmer Giles of Ham, all, all, all Tolkien stuff. And so I thought, well, let's, let's do a movie about dragons. And so we made a movie called Dragon Slayer. 
And I, I just want to say as a kind of an advertisement, really, that um, this movie, which was made with chemical special effects at you know, ILM, George's company, we were the first non-Lucas show to, to go through um, industrial light and magic. It had a twofold uh, uh, benefit for, for us. It allowed us to get really first class special effects done in, in a way that wasn't like science fiction. It's the bunch of dragon stuff and strange landscapes from the Iron Age. And um, at the same time, it, it taught ILM how to deal with an outside client. So it was great for both of us. And um, I want to say that uh, when you take the subtleties of, of film with its tremendous pixel depth, and you then grind that down into a, a DVD, which is a 720p with an 8-bit pixel depth, suddenly colors that were on the edges of the special effect there was in, embedded in a plate, you know, the background, suddenly the colors get binned. They, they aren't subtle anymore. One has to, a, a green one either has to be green or it has to be blue or either light or dark. And so the result is we wound up on television for a long time with this sort of awful old fashioned looking uh, special effects. Uh, and we were very ups upset about that. I mean, I never wanted to watch Dragon Slayer, but suddenly Paramount took a tremendous interest in remastering everything. And uh, Dragon Slayer has now just been re-released as a remastered uh, movie, and it's a, a completely new modern movie. It's wonderful. So especially the 4K. One of the other things that goes on, of course, in a DVD is that you, you're reducing the color space. You're also reducing the uh, gray space. And uh, uh, whenever you reduce pixels, let's say you have a white pixel next to a black pixel, suddenly if you reduce everything down, they have to blend. It's a Photoshop kind of thing. So you get a gray. And suddenly Derek Van Lint's photography on a DVD looked just really bland. And now suddenly the Blu-ray, especially the 4K, all that rich black and all, all that all that tremendous uh, HDR kind of looking stuff just came to life again. So I recommend everybody to run out and get a new copy of Dragon Slayer. It's terrific. But in the middle of all that movie, the point of your question is that here we are in England, um, making that movie at Pinewood Studios and uh, about 30 miles outside of uh, London. Um, and one of the sequences in that movie re required us to build an Iron Age village, which is stucco uh, buildings with thatch roofs and, you know, um, uh, you know, a little landscape there. We found a place called Stalker's Farm on a little canal that you could look around about 300 degrees and you couldn't see London. It was great. And it was very expensive to be there too. It was, uh, they, they knew the value of that location that the people who owned Stalker's Farm. And so we were paying a fortune to build this village. And, and uh, here we are on the first uh, night shooting. We have these big uh, towers where we had these gigantic Klieg lights uh, that Derek Van Lint was using to produce moonlight. And uh, it took us like, you know, four or five hours just to get that all set up correctly. So we didn't get our, we weren't gonna get our first shot until midnight. And um, and here we are. Um, we've got extras. We're going to do a big dance. We're going to reveal that the young man who is one of the leads in the story is actually a woman uh, trying to avoid this strange lottery, which they uh, hold every year to produce a victim for the dragon. And we had to go, you know, look at these people all dressed in burlap to make sure they weren't wearing wristwatches and didn't have any glasses on or any uh, sneakers, you know, trainers, whatever. And, uh, and, and then we had a choreographer rehearsing this kind of Iron Age uh, gavotte sort of dance. And, uh, and, and you know, and my job as a producer of the movie was to bring goods and services to the set, which I did. And um, and then uh, Matthew is getting rehearsing, getting the lighting going, and he's rehearsing the choreography and how we're going to block the shot for this young person who's coming out for wearing a dress for the first time. And I discovered that I was not very interested in watching all this stuff happen. This should have been like the best movie day of my life. But instead of wanting to sit on the set and, and, and watch Matthew do the work and, and get our movie going, um, I thought it was more interesting to go sit in a trailer, take my HP 41C alphanumeric programmable calculator, sit alone there and program that thing to play a Dragon Slayer version of Hunt the Wumpus. And I realized that if that was the case, you know, if I am more interested in sitting alone with a doing some coding than I am watching stuff happening in a movie, 
being made, you know, tremendous opportunity, then I'm in the wrong business. And that was in 1980. And with a slight detour about five years later, four years later, when I made, um, directed a movie called Warning Sign, I was preparing from that moment on to join the world of uh, video game design and development, which I did. Before I you join, me, go ahead. Before you joined the computer game design, um, you also worked on several other movies. For example, you worked on the title sequence for George's film. Oh, yeah. 1138. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> and these are things that, that add a lot to the movie. For example, well, I really love the fact that the titles scroll downwards instead of upwards. Was this your idea? I don't think so. It was probably George told me what to do. He, he just didn't know how to make something look like it was um, going to be generated by a computer. And I did have that animation background. I'm a graphic designer. And so I was able to whip that together with not much problem using a lot of photo negatives, you know, that kind of stuff that I would take photographs of, of um, stuff, you know, black, black on white, and then flip it around. So you had a big set of masks really with see through stuff. And it was pretty easy to do. And it was all just done under an animation crane. Um, I guess my proudest moment of uh, THX though, is that uh, there's a scene, there's a sequence in there where you're zooming through a tunnel in a, a sports car. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the, the and uh, every now and then there's an insert where the the, the lead um, you know is um, shifting gears. Well, the hand that's shifting the gears is me. <laughs> so so I got to do the inserts. You know later you know after this whole thing was done you know we go in a garage somewhere and get, get a light in the car and I shift gears. So and did you ever use your first animated the uh, short film? A child's introduction to the cosmos yeah. as reference of what you're capable of creating independently. I mean, did you actually showcase it to people to pitch around ideas in Hollywood? No, I didn't have to do that. Um, it's just there in the background, really. And, and the other, the other student movie, uh, the, the Great Wall City of Zan, which is a much more ambitious movie. I shot the entire uh, child's introduction to the cosmos in one 24-hour period. We had a very nice um, uh, Acme uh, animation crane at USC in this humble little building. Now, at, at USC um, Film School is this huge set of buildings. It's been financed by George and by Steve and Zemeckis and all these other guys, you know, it made a lot of money. And so it's a fabulous place. But in the old days, it was previously a, a stable, w- little wooden building off in the middle of nowhere on the edge of campus. But in the middle of this funny little building, there was this beautiful animation crane, which was a huge value for me. And um, I prepared all the artwork and sat down one evening and uh, just did the entire uh, child's introduction to the cosmos in one sitting. And it took about 20 hours. And, uh, you know, just sitting there at that animation crane. I was all prepared, of course, had all the cells and everything ready to go. And. It's really a puppet movie. It's the puppets are all made out of, you know, just uh, the same material you make the cells out of. It's just uh, acetate plastic painted on the backside and with um, um, a little bit of um, adhesive, the double faced scotch tape underneath there, nicely powdered with a little bit of uh, baking soda to make sure it doesn't stick too much. And, uh, you know, I did that all. And now, so you moved it, you moved the elements yourself and filmed yeah. it? Yeah, it's a puppet movie. It's puppet animation, but it's flat puppet animation. So it looks like it's cell animation, sort of. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I did another movie a few years later. This is when I came back to be an a animation teacher. I was also finishing another film called The Great Wall City of Zan. And there's one sequence in there where a train goes through a set with a circus, circus behind it. You know, it's an engine and, and it's got steam coming out and a little guy driving and the wheels are turning and, and, and it's pulling a, a bunch of cars with monsters inside. They're kind of circus monsters. And that sequence, that, that sequence itself took 24 hours of, st- of, of work for me to get it to, to be done, let alone the rest of the movie. It was much more ambitious and took forever to get it finished. Uh, anyway. Yeah, and these so, are things that nowadays take minutes, if yes. anything. Oh, yeah. Now you could. Uh, well, people do. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that I learned to do a few years, you know, many years ago, I guess, was, you know, how to do flash. And nowadays you can make an entire movie in flash. 
without any trouble at all. In fact, uh, the guys did the secret of Kells and the Irish guys who did those. I think those are all done in Flash. Well, nowadays Flash is dead, unfortunately. Oh, and dead, as dead, a Flash dead. developer, um, it hurts me still. Yeah. Have but, you ever tried? Yeah. Uh, have you ever tried um, uh, you know, Animate, which is the latest version of, mm -hmm. of Flash? Have you ever tried turning that into an iOS product or, at all? I have back in uh, 2011 when they started allowing um, people to export Flash games and Flash animations to iOS. Uh, I tried to use it. The performance wasn't that great. And back then, Steve Jobs had his op open letter about his thoughts about Flash, which eventually led to the demise of the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, f I suffered the same thing. Yep. Oh, well. Every it's now great and that then, we're both Flash developers. Yeah, every now and then Former I think... Flash. Well, every now and then I think, gee, I may, maybe I'll go back and... Um, you know, nowadays you can you can buy sort of sort of plugins and so forth that will will do a conversion. You don't have to you don't have to know uh, whatever the C C like language is and so forth. You can just use mm -hmm. ActionScript. Although ActionScript kind of went downhill when they tried to make it as good as Java and <laughs> just ruined it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I know how to they... use it anyway, so you know. Oh well. Anyway, so that's my story uh, uh, about how I got out of movies and, and, and vectored toward video games. I was always interested in games uh, from early high school, but there was no such thing as computer games. The cool part is that in the, after my first year at USC film school, um, my wife and I went back to Hanover for the summer. And she was teaching uh, uh, grade school in, in Los Angeles. We already had this all set up when I was going to, going to go to USC. And so, she, you know, her school let out. We jumped in a car and went back to Hanover. And at that, that was in 1964. And um, Dartmouth, at, at Dartmouth, uh, they had just, uh, uh, Kemeny and Kurtz, uh, they, they were, they had just um, uh, started um, BASIC, the computer language. Now, here I am, an art guy, but with a kind of a technical bent. You know, if you're an animator, you have to have a little bit of that. And so I learned how to program a computer by studying BASIC. And it was really interesting at Dartmouth. There was a, a, a timeshare system. There was some gigantic G, GE computer sitting in a cellar somewhere. I never saw it. And instead, in various offices around the campus, they would set up teletypes. And you would go into this room, and, and it would be a, this incredible din of the teletypes crack, clacking away at 10 characters a second as Dartmouth students would be sitting there trying to learn how to do programming. And of course, the, the first thing I did was try to, you know, teach basic, using basic, teach the computer how to place paper, rock, scissors. So, that, you know, I was always interested in games. In high school, I developed a kind of an electric football game where you had all sorts of wiring in a cabinet and uh, little switches on the side. It's kind of like um, the secret way you play Stratego. And, and you could set these little switches that was kind of your play. And the other guy would set his switches for what he thought the defense would be. And you could press a little button that looked like a doorbell. And lights would light up to tell you the results of all this. And all my friends in high school thought this was really cool. And they would borrow this thing and go and play it for, for days and weeks at a time. So I have this background in, in interesting games. But of course, there was no such thing as a video game industry back then. This is in the 60s. And I didn't even uh, wind up with a personal computer until the middle 70s when I got an Apple II Plus computer. That was my first thing. And of course, it did BASIC, but um, I built a game in BASIC. You can still play it. You can go to my website and pick up a thing called Binary Gauge, which was written in BASIC, but then compiled. With, there was a compiler that Microsoft put out called TASK, the AppleSoft compiler. And it, it sped up BASIC by a factor of 12 which was good enough to do a low res model railroading game. And you can actually, uh, I've actually modeled the entire streetcar system of Portland, Oregon using the, that program in, in, the, in, in, at the, in the present day, running through an emulator, a uh, wonderful emu uh, Apple II emulator. And then I, I also was getting my chops together. So I did a, a, an RPG-ish sort of game called Space Snatchers. And this is also available on my website, can play it in Windows 11. And uh, 
to do that, it was a tile-based game. It was like 20 by 10 tiles and uh, using uh, Apple high res which is uh, actually wound up being 14 by 16 dot tiles with only a limited color palette. And I realized that I was never going to get anywhere with basic. I had to learn assembly language, 6502 assembly language, uh, which I did. And at first I thought, well, how's this going to work? And I remember getting a whole bunch of tiles together with, which made some sort of picture, you know, when I wrote the stuff in from a diagram on paper that I had, all these tiles I had. And then I switched over from, to start it to go and to run the assembly language stuff, I switched over from low res, which was, you know, operating the basic thing. Then I hit a, 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 a hit an address in there and suddenly, I, and I thought, gee, when I do this, it's probably gonna be really fast. It's probably gonna kind of boom on there, unlike basic, which would just go chunk, a chunk, a chunk. So I hit the switch and the picture was just there. Now, there was no, there was no swoosh. It was just boing. It's there, and I realized if I learn assembly language and do the game in assembly language, I can just do it, and it will be wonderful. So I did, and I pulled every trick you can pull in assembly language. My God, I wrote a scripting language in the middle of it all that you can turn into a scripting language for a while, and then it becomes a, a, a certain command would go by, and it would turn back into regular assembly language. It was just amazing, and. Um, so that was that was one of my preps to become a game developer, but it never got published. And the reason originally, and the reason is that of course eventually, whatever platform is current, it goes out of date, and you can't uh, get any sales anymore. And that was certainly true for the Apple II. But in the middle of my finishing that game up, I got an opportunity to make a movie and uh, a write and direct a warning sign. So I did that, and uh, and that got in the way of publishing Space Snatchers. But at that time, George, uh, a friend, we both lived in uh, San Anselmo, California, and um, um, he was very interested in starting a, a video game company. The, the people had come to him, uh, I think from a company called, in those days, Epyx, E-P-Y-X, um, uh, not Epic Games, the Fortnite people. And, uh, and they said, look, we want you to do some Star Wars stuff or whatever. And, and they were going to finance things. So he started a thing called Lucasfilm Games. And I, uh, I was hanging around uh, the, the guys that he hired, including some people who have let, since become my friends, like Noah Falstein and David Fox and then Ron Gilbert and uh, Eric, the one wonder. And... Um, so I was kind of uh, getting to know those guys, and um, eventually they did. Uh, they were eventually getting far enough along so that George entrusted them to do a kind of a game spinoff of the Last Crusade, the Jones movie, and they they did it, and it exhausted all three of those guys, Fox and and Falstein and, and Gilbert, and they didn't want to do another one, but it was a big success. And uh, the company uh, in those days run by a, a wonderful guy named Steve Arnold um, wanted to do another one. And, and so they said, well, how the hell are we going to get that? Well, let's get Hal. They knew that I knew a little bit about this sort of thing. And, and uh, although I wasn't a big fan of adventure games. And so they, um, they said, well, let's get you. And, and, and they brought me into the company. When did you start working there? Spring 1990. And how was your first day like? It was weird. I was sharing an office with Noah Falstein at Skywalker Ranch, and uh, you know, it was uh, uh, it was a sleepy Mexican village at those days. <laughs> oh gosh. Anyway, um, uh, and it was also very interesting because uh, everybody except me, all you know, Ron and and David and 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 uh, Noah all ran off to the game developer conference, which was just starting up. It was like its second year, I guess, and. Because I was such a newbie, I wasn't invited to go. So I, I was alone so there uh, for a while. But, sorry? You stayed behind? Yeah, I stayed behind. It was wonderful. I could look out my window and you could see um, bobcats walk by your window out there in the wilds of West Marin. Um, every now and then a coyote. It was just amazing. So... Um, Anyway, uh, the, the movie that they wanted to make was based on another a screenplay that was intended to be another Jones movie. 
And it was uh, based on, it was going to take place in Africa where, where uh, Chinese uh, people uh, had migrated or at least made contact. And it was going to be something about someone called the Monkey King. And uh, Noah was not especially enthusiastic about this and didn't really understand what we were going to do with it. And, and I looked at it and I just thought this, no wonder they didn't make this movie. It's just not something we can turn into a video game. We've got to come up with something else. And so and we thought about it. And George, in his main house out there in, in the Casio, the Skywalker Ranch, had, had built a, um, a chunk of the, of the building was devoted to um, a library. And the library was intended to be a production design library. So it was filled with picture books and stuff that would be reference material for someone designing the production of a movie. And so Noah and I went in there and we started looking through books and we found these a lot of books, you know, kind of mystic places, you know, mysteries of the past kind of books. And one of them, a time life book, literally called Mystic Places. Um, we were looking through there and uh, one of the chapters was about Atlantis. And we turned the page and here was a diagram of Atlantis with concentric circles, you know, interrupted by canals. And we looked at this and we looked at each other and we said, my God, that, that's a game. And so we sat down and, and kind of roughed out the idea for a, 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 an Atlantis game. And then um, I kind of put my screenwriting chops to work to really flesh out that into a coherent story we could tell, you know, invented the character of Sophia Hapgood and, um, and the, um, the evil German Nazis, which we were stuck doing. And um, the whole idea of oracalcum and the idea that could be a magic potion kind of a thing. And so um, we, we, we put together this story and uh, it, was, it was fun to do. Well, before Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, you're also credited on two other games. You're credited on The Secret of Monkey Island. Over there, you're credited as special guest film director. <laughs> Did you... It contributed in any way to the development or the writing of the game or uh, no, no, did no, they credit I didn't. you as a pun? Uh, Ron was just being a, a nice guy. He, you know, he was, it was kind of welcoming me into the company. Really. that's what that was. I didn't really have much to have anything to do with Monkey Island. I love Monkey Island, by the way. It's a wonderful game. And I appreciate the fact that Ron and, and Eric had gone off Um to they would go off to like Lake Tahoe and they would sit in a hotel room for days and they would improve scum. And the, the main improvement, they, they did two improvements in scum, which I took advantage of in Fate of Atlantis. And one of them was the fact that you could take characters instead of just walking them this way, they could, you could scale them and mm -hmm. have them walk down a street that was, had a perspective on it. And that was wonderful. It allowed us to tremendous uh, uh, improvement in freedom of uh, designing the visual look of a game. The other thing they did was they invented, um, they el elaborated the interface so that you could have all the verbs that you had to use in those days, uh, which I didn't love very much. Um, but you also had icons of the, that would show the various uh, items in your, uh, in your inventory. And so the game became much more visual and um, dealing with the uh, materials of the game from a player point of view became much more um, immediate. And so those two advances I thought were really great. And since the stuff that you're interested in is a little bit about you know, technical advances, um, Fate of Atlantis had three technical advances, advances okay? The, the, the first one was we were the first game at LucasArts that used 256 colors. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Hey, hallelujah! Deep Most paint. of them were sixteen colors at first, and then switched yep. to two hundred fifty-six. Yep. And all done with deep paint. Oh my god! Um, and the second uh, thing we did was uh, when the game was released, it was it was already a big success. It was the most successful adventure game I think that ever came out of LucasArts, and um, in terms of commercial uh, achievements, and it was so successful that. And it became uh, clear that in the in, in 91, 91 and heading into 92, it was finally released, um, that we could um, now attach uh, audio to this, that people were starting to buy sound cards in, in large numbers. And so we could count on the fact there'd be a big audience for an actual audio track. So we also became the first 
game from LucasArts that uh, had uh, audio dialogue to go along with the stuff you read on screen. And so, and then, and then the third advance was that our music department, um, uh, Michael Land and, and Pete McConnell and uh, Jake uh, B um, Bazakian, um, Bajakian and Clint. And, and anyway, these guys uh, were busy working on um, software to make music uh, interactive and adaptive. Mm -hmm. And so that was the third uh, advance that we did. We had, we had, we took advantage of that. But they had these very um, ambitious plans for how that would work. And we found that most of the stuff that you could do was just very confusing. And the, the one thing that iMuse did really well, though, it was the simplest darn thing you can think of. Um, when you finally wind up in uh, the, the three paths we created to get you through the game, collapsed into one when you were actually arrive in Atlantis, in that concentric set of circles. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see a lot of that uh, as if you were looking down upon those concentric circles. And there are these little sort of tiny little spider-like creatures running around, which are the, the Nazi soldiers that are there already, and then you. And um, the, what I used did adaptively, which is wonderful, we had a little theme music that was going on. And if you stopped to look around, the drum track would fade out. And then if you started to move, you'd get a, a drum beat to go with you. And it would come in and out very subtly. And it was the most effective thing that iMuse, I think, ever did, actually, to be honest with you. It, it really worked just beautifully. Mm -hmm. Enhanced the experience of that rather abstract, down-pointing, quarter-circle version of, 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 of the uh, uh, layout of, Am of uh, Atlantis very nicely. Now, at what stage of production was the concept of having three paths conceived? Was the decision made after it, the initial script uh, had been written, or was the game pitched from the beginning with the intention of including three paths? It was Noah's idea. He he was aware of uh, feedback that we'd gotten before I joined the company uh, from uh, the Last Crusade game, where they did have fighting because they they had it's, uh, in Last Crusade the game. They were just sort of experimenting with things and, and they did put some fighting in and they found out that that got a lot of pushback from people who just wanted to play an adventure game and solve puzzles and didn't want to have to be worrying about the kind of um, button button pushing stuff you have to do to, to do an action uh, element. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but they also knew from the feedback they got that there was a segment of the audience that really wanted to do that kind of action. And they had another uh, another idea that that they they got from feedback that uh, this is Noah mostly um, that there were people who were mostly interested in the social aspects of the game of, of that game, and so he said, "Look, let's just do three paths, and we'll do a path where you have a team path, and you're going to spend your time solving cooperative puzzles with another character." So we, I invited Sophia Hapgood for that purpose, and you're going to mm -hmm. you have another path which is uh, just, uh, just the puzzle path where you're just trying to just mechanically solve the kinds of traditional adventure game puzzles that already existed. And then you have the fist path where you can go and you can beat up a lot of Nazis and maybe get beat up yourself. So we, we did that. Uh, now Noah said, hey, let's do this. And I thought, okay. And uh, then Noah went off to, <laughs> to do the dig. David Fox went off to go and do public space stuff that they were trying to get going. And Ron Gilbert goes off to do another Monkey Island and uh, maybe leave the company and do something else, go to do Humongous. And, and here mm -hmm. I am making those paths work. And we realized that, uh, and this is also a mantra that, that, that I learned right away from, from Noah and David, is that you don't build things that people aren't going to see. Don't don't spend your time doing stuff that a lot of people will never experience. You know, you want to put your money where it's going to be seen and show it off. You know, it's like uh, money shots on a, in a movie. And so um, the three paths are independent, but they kind of reuse a lot of the elements in, in kind of different orders and with different emphases. But uh, I, I, I had no idea how software really worked. And, and so here we are in a two-year development cycle. And uh, it was longer than we thought it would be. And I, we began to realize how difficult it was to get all these paths together and make it all work. And 
you, 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 I wound up writing a, you know, a screenplay in Hollywood is maybe what, 120 pages. You want it to take place in a couple of hours. You usually overwrite a little bit, knowing that once you have the warm physical presence of an actor, you can cut a lot of dialogue and, and so forth and so on. And keep it compact and so forth. And in an adventure game, you're writing 500 pages of screenplay. And all this dialogue is insane. And so um, I realized eventually that we were never going to be able to get the game done if the paths actually kept going into Atlantis. So I made the design decision that the paths would all converge when you got to the submarine and get into Atlantis, which was a wise decision. It, 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 it allowed the focus to increase once you got to it, to Atlantis. And I, I thought that was a good idea. And so we did it and uh, got the game done. And, and how did you ensure that the plot remained captivating and held the user's attention across all three paths until the very end of the game? Well, I guess I relied on the idea of Joan's adventurous character. The, 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 there's an inherent sense of adventure in a Joan's scenario. And that's different from, say, Monkey Island, who knew that you would have adventures uh, walking around as a dopey pilot, a pirate. And um, uh, but in the case of Jones, that is an inherent idea. And so we just we just we built the game as a series of bubbles with transport between the bubbles. And so that one of the things we wanted to do, and this was something that I learned from playing Monkey Island, which is just an absolutely wonderful game, wonderful classic game. Um, was that uh, Monkey Island was a little bit starved for um, graphic novelty. You, know, you were basically in two locations for the entire game. And I thought that was not going to sustain attention with Jones. And so we had seven or eight bubbles where, the, where the, there is tremendous uh, graphic novelty as you progress through the game. You're in a set of caves, you're in uh, Morocco or you know, you're in uh, Algiers, you're, you're in Italy. And, and also, I, I also was very interested and still am interested in the concept of puzzles which are evergreen. In other words, puzzles that once you solve them, you still would have to work hard to solve them again, uh, that they would retain their puzzleness even after solution. And there are such puzzles. Uh, for example, um, in the, the standard kind of uh, mechanic in a video, video game, um, combat. You can look at combat as essentially an evergreen puzzle. You, the, the, the opponent that you're trying to blast, you know, moves around in a novel way each time. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the exact places you're standing in a, in a game will be different. And uh, it's just as hard to kill that guy the second time as it is the first. Now, of course, you acquire skills in order to be able to knock off people more easily. But nevertheless, Combat is one of those things that, that always renews itself. Um, uh, a few years ago, I, I built a, an adventure game on my own. And it's in Flash. You can still play it if you download it from my website. It's called Thorn of the Midnight Rose. It's an adventure game. It's, um, you, you wind up with a bunch of nodes progressing through the game. So it's a little bit RPG-ish as well. And um, it's done with slider puzzles. So everything, each time you come to a new node, you, you get a screen and you have a little character and several trees and things that are around there. It's all taking place in a, in a, in a forest. And um, it's a five by seven uh, set of sliders. And so every time you move your character, you're also moving a bunch of other stuff. And the way in which you solve puzzles is to be able to build up connections, you know, assemble certain, you know, move the sliders enough to get an image here. And um, every time you go to that node, the game randomizes how that, that's going to look. And slider puzzles, even when you get them done, even if you don't randomize them the next time, you still can't figure out how the hell you did it. Because to get anywhere, you've done five or six separate little steps. And it's hard to remember all those little steps. So, it, so that's a thing you can do. And I, I like puzzles like that. I also like puzzles that were kind of unusual. So... For example, there's a moment when you wind up uh, on Crete and you're in a dig site and uh, uh, you're finding one of those stones that you have to find to, to figure out the location of Atlantis. And um, the puzzle is to get 
behind a uh, transit and then look around using a, a telescope to figure out, you know, where, where you're going to find the, the, the thing you're looking for. So that's a kind of a puzzle. And I also wanted to introduce uh, action elements. Jones is a, is a fisty cuff kind of guy and, 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 and the movies are all adventurous, you know, then Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's, he's fighting in front of a Nazi airplane. He's jumping on a horse. He's, he's, he's down in a, in a cavern, you know, all this stuff. And so I invented uh, camel racing and uh, uh, car, car chases in, in Italy and a balloon, balloon uh, ride, you know, stuff like that. That's, that's not the traditional sort of thing that you saw in Adventure Games at that time, but have since become, uh, when it's become more codified, they, they, they sort of turned into the mini games you find in modern adventure games. Now, you, you talked about the, the game's locations. The, the final game's resource files contain an early iteration of the world map featuring the inclusion of Cadiz, Spain, and there are also mentions of Leningrad in the text files. Yeah. However, these particular locations were ultimately removed from the final version. Can you provide insights into the original uh, intentions or plans uh, for incorporating Cadiz and Leningrad? They were cuts. Just, just like uh, when you, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, I sort of had this idea that Leningrad still appears in the team play. I don't, I think you do go there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you do. Nope. I haven't, you know, I haven't played Fate of Atlantis in 15 years, so I can't remember. But I thought on the team play, we did briefly go there. Uh, you know, you go to a library in St. Petersburg. I thought, you know, whatever. I could be wrong. Um, Cadiz went out. Um, but, it, you know, you have to remember that um, a feature film is maybe 10,000 feet of film. Film, you know, goes, you know, at, uh, you know, pretty slow speed through the projectors. So a, a feature movie is about two miles long. And, um, but you shoot 250,000 feet of film to make that movie. Or if you're just, you know, really efficient, there are, there are, you know, there are people like Francis who shoots a million feet of film and tries to figure it all out later. But when I shot Warning Sign, I guess I shot it 200,000 feet or so and maybe 180,000. I was pretty careful. And I think in Dragon Slayer, we didn't shoot that much either. But you still then afterwards, you go and you sit down and you just get rid of a lot of stuff. And that sort of happens in the world of games too, but in a slightly different way. We thought we were going to get you know, Leningrad working and Cadiz working and we made some progress, but then eventually it, it, there were obstacles. It wasn't quite coming together the way the rest of the game was coming together. And some point along the line, you say, the hell with it, lose that. And I didn't realize, I've never looked at the resource files. I had no idea there was stuff still in there. So there are a lot of things in the resource files for games that were released that are quite interesting to look at. For example, in uh, you can find the resources of early iterations of Sam and Max in some of the early LucasArts games, so, yeah. yeah, which I understand well, that they were used in Scum U when they teach yeah. people how to use Scum. Yeah. Um, well, Steve Purcell, who invented the Sam and Max, a wonderful comic book series, you know, was one of the artists at LucasArts. And um, so, that's the reason why Sam and Max, mm -hmm. you know, infested LucasArts. Eventually, Mike and Mike Stemley and, and Sean Clark, you know, did um, a wonderful Sam and Max game, terrific uh, adventure game. But the, these particular editions of Sam and Max posed problems to uh, for LucasArts, basically, because in the remastered versions of the Monkey Island games, which were released in two thousand nine. LucasArts didn't have the rights for Sam and Max, and so they had to remove all of the Sam and Max references from the game. Oh. Too bad for them. Yep. Two months ago was the 30th anniversary of the CD-ROM version of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which, like you said, was the first official talkie game for LucasArts. During the production of the game, did you contemplate the idea of developing a talkie version? Well, or was it discussed only after the game was released? It was it was discussed in the in the in the the last few months of production. It's, it became clear we were going to probably do something like that because we, 
you know, there was a part of a company that paid attention to, you know, computer sales. It was always computer games, always PCs, basically. And um, we started to understand that sun cards were becoming a thing, you know, instead of, in those days, you, everything didn't ship with the machine, you know, and one reason why I've, I haven't had a tower computer since the last one that I owned in Windows 98, maybe, which I built from scratch, of course, and I got all the parts, it was fun. And uh, so that's the last tower I've ever owned. I just, everything else has been um, laptops because they all have everything in them already. You don't have to worry about what cards you have to stick in and will they actually be compatible and what do you have to do to the goddamn BIOS to make it work and, you know, all that stuff. And so, uh, but we were aware of that that was coming in. And so we started to think about it. And um, uh, at that time, it was just, it was, it was kind of like early sound in Hollywood. It was kind of like, here's a record and here's the movie and we're going to drop a needle down and hope to God it's in sync. You know, eventually it was all done digitally and, and there were cues in the, in the scum code that would, that would run it all. And so after, after Fate of Atlantis, the, the, the whole technical side of how you did audio became, um, you know, refined and, and perfected. But for us, it was it was pretty rough and ready, but it had a huge um, ed, uh, effect on sales. It was already a, a, a big seller, Fate of Atlantis, uh, but it, it, it really became a big seller once we had the audio and, and, and did it as a, a CD. Yeah, I have the CD-ROM version right here. Wow. A graphic Adventure by Hal Barwood. <laughs> wow. Wow. I guess I've, you know, I've, I'm sure I've got the same thing. I'm not sure I've got a machine that would still play it. I, I do have, I still have a wonderful DVD player. That's, it's only about as thick as a, as a jewel box. It's about this thick, you know, and you, this drawer pops open and I can stick it in a USB port and sort of get it to work. We'll see. Speaking of physical copies, Limited Run Games has re-released most of LucasArts Scum Games as collector's editions, except for The Dig, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Yeah. Now, considering the current revival of adventure games and the new Indiana Jones movie in theaters, and the upcoming collector's edition of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which will eventually be released, do you think there's a possibility of a new Indiana Jones Point and click adventure being developed involving both you and not Falstein? No. No, I don't. That's um, not the answer I was looking for. I know. Um, Noah might be interested. I'm not sure. Noah has gone off into the world of serious games where he's an expert. And, um, you know, I write books. <laughs> so. Um, and, and, and although I love Jones, I, I, I always loved the idea a, as a creator, um, more than Star Wars. I love the fact that, um, with Jones, I, although I, I had to make use of a character who existed and, and go, do it according to the Bible that, that existed. Um, but your, each Jones adventure in the movies, the three movies, each one is, is kind of an independent story that starts out taking place in a version of the real world. And only as you experience that real world do the fantasy elements creep into the story, which they always do. You know, at the end of Raiders of the Ark, Lost Ark, ghosts come out of the Ark and kill all the Nazis. So um, there's always that element, but you, it's always grounded in the real world and it's always independent from whatever went before. And so from a creator's point of view, in my point of view, that's just wonderful. It's ideal because I can just um, take something which is going to be grounded in the world and then lay on top of that uh, an, a fantasy element which grows through the, the telling. And um, I, would, I just love that kind of structure. So I'm, I, I love Jones for that reason. I love it more than Star Wars for that reason, although I've also, you know, love Star Wars. But... Um, Anyway, at the same time, uh, I, I, I don't want to do anything I, I, with, a, with the genre that I, I feel is, is been tortured. Uh, after Fate of Atlantis and after especially another Jones game that I did, uh, uh, and, uh, The Infernal Machine, which is the, our first 3D game, which I guess is another technical advance at LucasArts anyway. Um, uh, after that, 
other people were trying to do Jones games. None of them actually really got going. They sort of got going and then stalled out. And then we hived them off. And there, there was the, uh, the Phoenix one, I think, was done of, in, outside the, the, the group and, and, and then published by us. And, and, and it just, uh, I thought the stories were no good and, and, and the, the games were just not interesting. And it kind of um, spoiled me for wanting to attempt to get back into that. Uh, I think that from a game point of view, you could do another Jones game if you're smart and you don't try to do it with Nazis. And, uh, but I don't really want to be that person. I don't think Noah does. Maybe either. you're the missing element. Maybe uh, the fact that you um, didn't well, make any other Indiana Jones games was the main problem. Well, it could be. I, they, 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 they wanted me to sort of consult on things, but the truth is I would do it and they just ignore everything I had to say. So we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, you know, my interests have, have, have kind of uh, swiveled away from that a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, as to the latest movie, I think they're still stuck in the same rut. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of sad. Well, you know, in my conversation with Noah Falstein, I told him that I won't end the conversation until he promises me that he's going to work on a new Indiana Jones game. <laughs> now, I'm not going to put you on the spot in the same way, but, you know. Did he actually I'm not lie gonna... and promise? He said that he promises that he'll make a new Indiana Jones game. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, I promise, sure. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, I just want to say, this, this is interesting. It took um, two years. I, I came to the LucasArts in 1990, and about just exactly two years later, the game was released. It was supposed to mm -hmm. release about a year and a half in advance, but we were we were being published in those days uh, by by uh, ER, uh, EA, and um, um, and we we didn't like that arrangement. We thought that they didn't uh, do very well by us, and that they if there was any hint of competition between trying to sell a game of theirs to this in those days retail outlets um, or our stuff, they would sell their stuff, and we got the short end of the stick. And so they wanted to get out of that and publish our own stuff, and. The management of LucasArts in those days said, we're not going to, we're not ready to ship Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Uh, we've got to still work on it. And the reason is that um, it's not done. But the real reason was we wanted to get past the end of our contract so that we could publish Fate of Atlantis. And of course, the other advance is that uh, Indiana Jones was the first game, I think, that actually bore the LucasArts logo as well as Lucasfilm Games. And when we came out in, in the spring of late spring of uh, 92. But the good thing about that really was that the game was sort of done four months earlier. And it's the only time in my life that I've had like time to actually polish something. You know, the game was done except for bugs. <laughs> we just polished the heck out of that game for the last four months so we could get, get to the expiration of our contract with EA and then publish it. And that was a wonderful experience for me. It was just great. And, and unfortunately, the company did not learn from that experience. And how soon after Fate of Atlantis was released did you start production on Indiana Jones and the Iron Phoenix? I can't remember. I, I, was, only bit, I was only very peripherally involved in that. That was, I think, Eric and Joe Penny, I guess. Joe Penny involved in that. Can't remember. And so did, did, you, did you consult in any way? They they wanted me to. They were having trouble coming up with a solid story, and unfortunately, um, I think Iron Phoenix is the one where we were going to do n Nazis being revived in South America, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, I've forgotten the movie about Hitler's, you know, coming back as the Hitler kids. You know, uh, what was the name of that movie? Sorry, it's been a while. Anyway, uh, there was a kind of a movie done like that. And so they, so that game got sort of put together with that idea. And it's a good idea. The only problem is that we had a tremendous uh, foreign audi audience of people who bought a lot of our games in Germany, which is a country very, very interested in uh, adventure games to this day. And, um, and I've worked there w with some of those people. And um, in Germany, you can't have Nazis. Hey, 
forget it. You won't sell a, you won't sell a single copy of this game if you build it in Germany. So the game got canceled because the, Germany was a, a substantial fraction of the anticipated revenue from any game we did. And so we just couldn't afford to build that game. And the plot of Indiana Jones and the Iron Phoenix served as the foundation for a four-issue Dark Horse comic of the same name, yep. which you described as toned down and incoherent. What was the issue with that comic yeah. adaptation, pun intended? Uh, well, I was sort of, I'm one of the writers of those things, you know, and it's one of those things where um, I'm not especially hip when it comes to uh, you know, frame by frame representation of a story, which is you're trying to make it as dynamic as possible, even though it's all still pictures. And mm -hmm. so there, there's a, there's an aesthetic you have to absorb and understand to do a, a good comic book. And Dark Horse does a lot of good ones, but the artists that they hired to do those four books, uh, just you know, got the bit in their teeth and decided they're going to do it their way and they're going to change the story and make it the way they like it. And they had no idea about storytelling to be, to be blunt about it. So, okay. That's the, moving that's, on to, <laughs> okay, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> I'm still kind of, no, go ahead. If you want to say anything credit. else. Of no, it's, it's okay. I, I, I like those comic books. I still, I, I'm glad I had a, a credit there. It's, it, it's a dark horse, a wonderful company and they're, they do, they ply their trade not very far from where I live. Moving on to Day of the Tentacle, you're credited on Day of the Tentacle for opening fixed by Hal Barwood. Could you provide some insights into what specific elements or issues you addressed in the game's opening or how I your contributions helped? I can't remember a single thing except that I like Tim and, 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 uh, Oh God, I'm having trouble. My, you know, I'm an old guy now, and my brain is going. Um, the opening was fixed by you. Yeah, I can't remember. I, I, I have no idea if I. I think what happened in those days, it, it, it continued for, for my whole career at Lucas Arts. We always had these things called pizza orgies when you would have kind of a rough cut of your game and you would present it to people who were at Lucas Arts but outside your team. You, it would be mm -hmm. a bunch of people from marketing and. Uh, uh, infrastructure and management and everybody, they would come down and we'd serve pizza and you get to play part of the game. And, and the, in the, in the first, uh, uh, few years that they were very valuable, uh, feedback sessions. So it's possible that I went to one of those and played some stuff and didn't like what I saw at the beginning of tentacle and, and had some advice for them, but I just can't remember what it could possibly have been. It certainly was true with, with fate of Atlantis. Uh, what we learned was that the opening uh, stuff was way too heavy and a lot of exposition that had to go away. And uh, so we, we uh, did a lot of work to smooth out the opening of, of Fate of Atlantis from our feedback. Later in life, in the last X number of years, the pizza orgies just became um, pro forma. Nobody wanted to say anything bad about another team that was developing a game and they were so expensive to develop that uh, all the criticism and the open kind of feedback system and the collaboration had vanished. And it was just a, it was just kind of a cocktail party, you know, that you would go to eat some pizza, have a beer, be nice. Well, one of the things that were changed in the opening of Fate of Atlantis was the fact that I think the intro was a very long cutscene. And you've added interactive elements at the beginning. So when Jones falls through yeah. the trap door and falls down to the, the library and falls through the floor of the library into that other room. Yeah. So that was... Uh, that, um, that was part of it. But also there, there was some stuff that was kind of at the beginning where he goes and he uh, deals with Sophia. Mm -hmm. And, and the, 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 that's where the real problems were. I think I already had the idea of doing um, adventure gaming when you don't even know how to do it. You know, you, part, of, part of the cool thing is Jones keeps having accidents, but the player is also having the same kind of accidents because there's no interface. There's no way to know how do I make this all happen. 
And I just, I just love that. And uh, so did everybody else who was playing it. So the, I'm pretty sure we had that going, but there was a lot of stuff going on, too much talk um, and, and without it being interactive dialogue, when he would go and, and visit Sophia and, and see what was going on with her and find out about the fact that she had stolen this medallion of Nirab South and blah, 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 and from Iceland. And, um, and you would find out in a kind of a movie-ish sort of way that she was an unreliable person. You know, she was kind of a, not quite um, on the up and up. And, and uh, that, that had to get really, really trimmed. And everything had to get turned into dialogue trees and much more compact. That, that was, I guess, the real problem there. Okay. In 1995, you were the project leader and designer of your first Super Nintendo game, Big Sky Trooper. Yep. What can you tell us about that project? Well, it was, it was fun to do. Uh, every now and then I play that game. Um, and every now and then there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a guy who does a YouTube thing where he does old games and plays through them all. And it's amazing how much attention he paid to Big Sky Trooper. And I, I kind of followed him through once, you know, trying playing it and using him to kind of give me clues because I couldn't remember a lot of the stuff that went on. Um, it was very tough to develop that game. We started, I started in about uh, the end of 92. Uh, and uh, we didn't have a group of people inside the building who could program a 6502, which is what really it was 65816 or whatever it was, still was using that same assembly language and, and we didn't have a lot of people who could do it. Uh, the one guy that we, we had around who really could do it, uh, Dean Sharp, was going off to do a different project and um, Tony Shea, who also knew 6502, went off to go work elsewhere outside the game industry for a while. And so we had to find someone to bring someone in from outside who could program. And unfortunately, we picked someone to come in. And I, I'm not going to say anything about the person or his name or anything, but he was just completely incompetent. And, and eventually, he had to go away. We didn't get anywhere with that. Um, and so... Uh, it was just a very difficult development cycle. The, the first person who was going to do all the art went off to do um, a wonderful game, a um, uh, Star Wars uh, a, a, a game, uh, Dark Forces. And, uh, and then so you know, everything stalled out repeatedly. And it took about three years to get that game done. Uh, eventually, Tony came back to the company and he became the principal for, uh, programmer. And the other problem is you're stuck in a tiny little cart, uh, uh, an eight bit an eight bit cart, which really means one megabyte of everything. So it's all tile based, and and you have to be very careful how all the tiles work. And we would continuously we get stuff done, and we'd overflow the cart, and we'd have to go back and do all sorts of stuff. And and, and it's very you know laborious because you're doing all this stuff and. Uh, very compressed graphics and with, you know, code changes that have to happen. And, oh, my God. And so it was just really, really rough to get it done. And, and the, the other problem, of course, was we, were, we, were, we, we didn't want to take inventory risk. All the inventory in those days came from actual Japan. And so if you had to make a big bet uh, on, you know, to buy the right number of units, you know, make a little money and buy X number of units. But if they don't sell, you're just stuck. And um, uh, so we didn't want to publish any of our Nintendo games. And JVC came along and was willing to publish uh, Big Sky Trooper, which was great. So we did the development and they did the uh, took the inventory risk, which turns out to be a big risk because we had this 8-bit cart. And that, that, that made certain limitations in the same thing that bothered me about Monkey Island, bothered me about my own game, Big Sky Trooper, because of this, the small cart meant that there was going to be a little bit of um, uh, visual starvation that would occur because we just didn't have enough room to have a great variety of looks. And, mm -hmm. um, and when we finally came out, Nintendo came out with, um, oh God, Gorilla Game. What the heck was the name? Anyway, that was a 32-bit cart that they could they could do because they would charge themselves 
much less money to do a ROM than they would charge outside developers. So we were here we are trying to present a game that's sitting on an 8-bit cart and they were doing God. Donkey Kong. Donkey uh, no no no. Well anyway, might might have been. Anyway, yeah, could have been could have been the the, for, the Super Nintendo Donkey Kong. Anyway, it was a big hit and it was a 32-bit cart so they had much more interesting graphics and it just it, it came out roughly the same time we came out and we just were buried. And so it was a, not a success. It was an agonizing uh, development process to get it all done, you know, with people who really kind of barely knew what they were doing. So it was really tough. There's a phenomenon that's worth mentioning, I guess, in the world of game development as it existed 25 years ago, a generation ago. And it was intensified at LucasArts. But in general, if you're in a, um, I've said this before, if you're in the world of movies, you're, you're in, a, in a world which is, you know, a strangely fluid, creative world, but it's been around for 80 years. And so it's developed a tremendous uh, number of people who know what they're doing. And so when you make a movie, you're basically making a movie with a, a, a crew of experts. And you might say when you're getting ready to make a movie, gee, I'd like to have Gordy Willis shoot my movie. And he's not available. So you say, well, I'll take Dean Cundy. And uh, instead, you get Frank Stanley. So your third choice becomes your, your, your guy. And you know what? He's just absolutely terrific because he knows, you know, he just is super knowledgeable. He's super competent. He just knows everything. And, and, and movie crews in general and, and all their departments are like that. And, and when you get to the world of game development in the 90s, it wasn't like that at all. You'd have a team or sort of a team of maybe 25 people, and most of them hardly knew what they were doing. Most of them just came out of college, and it's their first job. Mm -hmm. And so they don't even know how to go to work. And so uh, you have to deal with that. And that was a big problem when it came to uh, LucasArts, because George, we're, we're going through the transition here now. Uh, as um, ILM became very famous, uh, some of the people at ILM were um, uh, going off to do uh, their own companies. And uh, one of them was going off down to L.A. to found Boss Film. And, uh, uh, and, and in order to attract the kind of expertise that he needed for his company, he would have to pay big bucks to the salary people who were going to work for him. George did not want to do salary competition. And so, uh, and I guess his board of directors at Lucasfilm didn't want to do it either. And so he refused to do those high uh, cost salaries. And sure enough, eventually, as, as as periodically will happen in the movie business, suddenly people aren't making special effects movies so much. Boss film went under. Luke, uh, ILM survived. But George took that same concept to Lucas Arts and didn't want to hire people who, who were experienced in their trade. So instead, we wound up with a lot of people who were wonderfully talented and very bright, but who were uh, very inexperienced. So I'll give you an example. When we were doing Infernal Machine, uh, I, which I think has some of the most brilliant level design I've ever seen in a game. Uh, nevertheless, those levels took us about a year each to do, you know, simultaneously. But 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 basically, uh, uh, one of my team would be working on a level for like a year, and we discovered that down at Insomniac, they would do them in, in six weeks because they had a, a different set of people who were, were working on those things who were not only bright and talented, but uh, with tremendous experience, you know, to, to get things done in a quick and efficient way. And that really bit me on uh, 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 Big Sky Trooper, unfortunately. Now, that same year, Full Throttle was released, and you have two credits on Full Throttle. You're credited as said it was a good idea. <laughs> Did you? Yes, I did think it was a good idea. I did. I thought it was a wonderful idea. I thought that Tim, Tim, the idea of 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 uh, doing a guy, uh, a tough guy who you know, you know, the puzzles would be just take the guy's head and slam it on the bar. You know, <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. So full throttle, yeah, good idea, terrific. Yep.
and you're also credited in the Special Biker Haiku section. You remember your haiku? Your haiku was, Sky covers the land, dark goggles cover my eyes, <laughs> speed covers my tracks. Elder. <laughs> wow, I was good. <laughs> yeah. the, only, the only problem with Full Throttle, it's a wonderful game. It's got, terrific, it's got a terrific look. It's got a terrific aesthetic of, of, of how you go about it. It's, it's you know, big and, 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 you know, you know, bulgy muscles kind of idea through the whole game. It just had that wonderful united feel, and I, I love it. But the problem was that it was expensive to make, and there really are only about 12 puzzles in the whole game. It's a very short game. Now, that actually is it's to bad. my taste. Yeah, it's to my taste. I like games that I can get done fast. Uh, my wife likes to do uh, jigsaw puzzles, and I like the ones that have 500 pieces. You know, where, hey, we'll do this on the weekend. You know, I don't have to worry about it. And so for me, it, it, was, it was just great. It's almost an ideal game for me. But it was, that was a trick. And, you know, it was also coming along at a time when adventure games really weren't doing very well in terms of audience uh, uh, interest. And uh, that started to change 10 years later when casual visual, uh, adventure games got going. But that was a problem for Full Throttle, unfortunately. Wait, but Full Throttle sold a million copies. Who told you that? It's a known fact. Is it wrong? I don't believe it. But maybe. <laughs> maybe, over, maybe over time it did. It's a good game. I, I so think that I, it I became it. their most successful adventure game. You said that the Indiana Jones uh, and, and I think, the yeah, Atlantis, I think, which was... I think Fate was the most, most the biggest one by far, but maybe not. I'll take your word for it. Anyway, it's a wonderful game. I love it. And Tim did a great job. And that same year, The Dig was also released. And as you are well aware, it went through several iterations before it was released. It had four project leads and it went through various changes. And in the final game, you're credited in the additional text section. Could you share some details about your involvement in the development of the game in any of the iterations? I was involved in only in a negative way. Um, the, the guys who worked on that game, Noah first, Brian Moriarty, and then finally Sean Clark. I, I, was there another project leader, Joe Pinney, maybe yeah, for a while? Yeah, Dave Joe? Grossman was the third for... Oh, Dave, 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 Dave was in it for a while. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, who also was, you know, one of the full throttle guys and tentacle guys. And I just I love those games. Um, I never believed in the dig from the moment it was described to me. And I come from the world of where that game was conceived, which is by Steven Spielberg. And, and I'm aware that, you know, in that world, you know, a lot of ideas are discardable. Just because uh, people who know how to make movies have those ideas doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're good ideas. There might be bright ideas, but there's a difference. And unfortunately, Noah and Brian and Joe and eventually Sean, I, I, I just don't think they had the perspective to understand that just because Steve Spielberg had blessed this idea that it was any good. And I just didn't believe in it. And I was, I just sort of thought, hey, guys. But I also, once they started working on it, I said, hey, just you got to go. You've got you to get the story down so that it actually works from front to back and then build that game. And, 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 and they all struggled to do it. They all struggled. The, game, the, the idea that Steve gave them was so vague, it wasn't even wrong. It was just this, it was just this idea. And so Noah tried to tackle it in, in a certain way and couldn't quite pull it together. He left the company. Brian um, tried to tackle it and he couldn't really kind of make it work. And he decided to go off and do some other stuff, which was more educational before he left the company. Joe um, gave it a look, I think, and then and Dave, Dave looked at it for a while and couldn't get it to work. And then finally, um, Sean really, you know, rolled up his sleeves and got that thing done. And I was so proud of Sean for doing that. And, and I just thought that was great. 
But unfortunately, by the time he got it done, it, the, the graphics were antique. Uh, the world had passed us by. And so it just was not a success. And it's a tragedy altogether. So what are the issues you see with the uh, script or the premise of the dig? I don't know. It just didn't, you know, Harlan Coben, who's a mystery writer, you know, has this mantra, which is uh, an idea is good if it produces pages, if it's, it's bad, if it doesn't. And, and, and I thought the dig didn't produce any pages. You know, the, 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 the basic idea just didn't seem to generate an actual story to go with it. It didn't seem to have, it didn't seem to sort of entail, wow, this is what's going to happen. It'll be great. You know, it didn't, it, it didn't contain anything which motivated the rest of the creators to kind of flesh it out. It just didn't have enough in it. And so it that, that's why it took various forms before it actually got done. And, um, you know, it was kind of a mystery. Well, you, you're going to go on this dig and what are you going to find? And no one knew. Uh, that's all I can say about it, really. I, I, I just thought it was... Uh, misbegotten in the 1970s you co-wrote an unproduced screenplay called home free i did the general premise is very reminiscent of the dig at least the basic premise of an astronaut stranded on a planet were I any did. of the ideas from that screenplay used in one of the iterations of the dig not to my knowledge it could be however it could be because steve certainly read it um could be that it echoed in steve's mind and that's Maybe where the that's dig, why you're credited. It might it might be. Um, Home Free is a wonderful screenplay about, and it's a just an absolutely wonderful movie. It should have been made, and it almost got made. It's one of those weird experiences in the in the movie world. I've had it. I even had it again last year, um, where uh, it's kind of like uh, vampire uh, uh, script. You know, uh, the vampire is lying in his crypt, and it gets dark, and he pushes the lid off the coffin and gets up and walks around. But then the daylight comes and he goes back in his coffin. And that's kind of what happened to the, to the, to home free. <laughs> it's just a terrific movie. And it's uh, been, a t almost got made several different times where, you know, somebody sort of says, Oh my God, this is great. And we'll get it going. And then it fizzles anyway. And it's that, that happened repeatedly. It was good. That was by the way, home free. Um, that's how we met Steve. That's how Matthew and I first became acquainted with Steve Spielberg because Larry Tucker was the person who commissioned us to write Home Free. It was also called for a while Star Dancing, but at Home Free was the title we liked. And um, uh, so he, he, he knew of this young guy who was at Universal doing TV uh, stuff, you know, TV series. And let's, you know, maybe we'll find a young director who wants to make his debut and we'll, 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 we'll you know, that's how we could get it made. And uh, so you know, I'll bring this kid over and we'll talk to him. And so that's how we met Steve. And that didn't work, but eventually Steve came back to us and said, look, I've got this weird news item from a cop kidnapping down in Texas. And uh, we, we did, uh, you know, Sri Lanka Express from that. And um, maybe Home Free could have been a, a great point to click adventure game. Yes, it could. Yes, it could. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And it's really, and there's another sort of sidebar interest of that. But um, it didn't happen. Too bad. Um, the, the sidebar is that um, you're wearing a Star Wars T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in 1966, uh, when I was at uh, Graphic Films, which is the uh, my teacher's company uh, at, at USC Film School, he taught a thing called filmic expression, the most interesting class I took there. And he liked me and hired me to become kind of an animator designer guy at his company. And I spent two years there and it was and nowadays, in those days we made industrial films, uh, mostly a animated stuff, but some live action. And um, uh, nowadays it would be a, a, a web company where you do websites, you know, and that, that's kind of the equivalent. And uh, um, anyway, so we were doing that stuff and we got contracts to do a series of short films to describe various aspects of the, of the wonderment of the Boeing 
SST, which was going to be the rival to the Concorde. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I spent some time in, in, in the mid 60s up at, in Seattle at Boeing and running around uh, to meeting various people who were doing uh, the various parts of the design of that uh, airplane, which of course never saw the light of day. But one of the one of the, uh, at one moment we were we were taken in to see we we had, we had seen pictures of a of a version of it, and then we were said oh no we're going to show you something we're, uh, there's an artist who's working on some stuff and we went down to a studio and there's a guy there who's got a painting that's I don't know five feet across with um, the SST and instead of being this weird delta wing thing it had swept wings like the F one eleven and the the Tomcat you know, with this uh, swept wing airplane uh, that, that you could adjust. And uh, the artist was a guy named Ralph McQuarrie. Well, eventually we, we were going to make these movies. And so down in LA and w w w our little company uh, was really stressed for people to get the work done. And, and I'd met Ralph up in Seattle and he's this terrific illustrator guy you know, who was just tremendous. And so we, we brought him down to LA to work on some of these little movies. You know, we, we got, we got, we got to loan him out from Boeing. And then he left Boeing and he moved to Los Angeles and, um, became an illustrator, a uh, freelance guy. And when we were developing Home Free with Larry Tucker, uh, we, they, we wanted some concepts of, of what that would be like. And I said, gee, I know this guy, uh, Ralph McQuarrie. He's a terrific illustrator. I think he's in L.A. now. Let's go talk to him and get some paintings done. So Matthew and I did. And he said, OK, let's do it. What do you want to do? And we said, we described four paintings we wanted to have him do. And um, eventually he called us up and he said, uh, OK, I've got the first one. I've got, you know, I want to see what you think of it before I do the next three. And in those days, Walt, uh, I'm sorry, um, George had already moved to Northern California and he would come down and Matthew and I were writing in his little house over in Benedict Canyon, because in those days I had two children, but he didn't have any. And we, so we could work at his house without going crazy. And uh, so George would come down on his visits to L.A. and stay with Matthew and Janet at his house in Benedict Canyon. And so George was down there. And so, uh, hey, come on along with us when we go look at Ralph's paintings. And so we did, and uh, we we're all looking at them. They were, it was fantastic. It's a, it, the, the concept behind Home Free was you're on a, a, a strange planet that's just covered with like uh, steps, uh, you know, the, the steps of Asia, just grass everywhere, and this big kind of RV that you're running around in in a spacesuit because even though it looks like grass, the atmosphere is unbreathable. And uh, so you've got the spacesuit on, and, and, and Ralph did this fantastic painting of that. It's available around. And um, George said, as, as he was looking at it, he said, you know, I'm going to do a science fiction movie and I'm, I'm going to remember you. And when Ralph McQuarrie became famous in the world because of Star Wars, which he basically did all the concept art for in the first three movies and mm -hmm. some of the matte paintings, too. He learned how to be a matte painter. Um, probably not quite as good as Pangrazio and some of the guys who are also doing matte paintings, but pretty good. And, and we introduced Matt, uh, Ralph to George. But the reason why Home Free didn't get made the first time, really, why Steve couldn't lift it off the ground, he, he was doing uh, The Duel, which was a big uh, TV movie hit. And uh, when, when, we, when we first met him, and he would have been a great candidate to do that movie, and it would have probably gotten made. But Doug Trumbull, who was also a special effects guy with his own special effects house, um, after... after um, 2001 uh, was doing um, a, a science fiction movie, um, running a silent running. And in those days, science fiction was the was the, the kind of movie that opened well on Saturday and is dead by Tuesday. Silent running made no money, and suddenly every studio in town was terrified of making a science fiction movie, and so Home Free couldn't get off the ground. It's interesting because I met uh, when I first met Doug, he was a camera operator at Luke, uh, at uh, Graphic Films, where the, the little industrial film company. He was, you know, sitting behind an animation crane all day. You know, it's never too late. You can always uh, get home free off the ground well, and make it a point-and-click adventure game. Uh, 
It could be. It, 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 it would be a very good one. It, it, it's got all the elements of a good game. And I've thought about, I've thought about also turning it and another book, a, a screenplay that Matthew and I, did, which never got done, which should have gotten done, uh, into a book. But the difficulty there is that those, those, those screenplays were written with, with Matthew. Matthew and I wrote them together. So uh, writing a book and then, you know, taking over the material from a possibly reluctant ex-partner uh, who's also a, a, my terrific friend still, um, it might, might be problematic. So I haven't done it. Moving on to my favorite Star Wars game. Speaking of Star Wars, Rebel Assault 2, The Hidden Empire. Oh my gosh. And well, as the director of live video on Rebel Assault 2, uh, could you provide some insights into what went during the pitch meeting for the project? Well, uh, there, there was almost no pitch meeting. Uh, uh, Vincent Let's Lee, make a Star Wars game. No, no. Vince had already done Rebel Assault 1. And it, it, you know, it was basically like Area 51, a wonderful arcade game where you just shoot a million monsters that pop up. I love those games. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that, that was my favorite arcade game for years. Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, you, you blow a bunch away and then the camera zips forward and then, uh, oh, my God, here they come again. Babbity, babbity, bap. Uh, it's just a, it's just a great idea. And, and we were able to take that concept and, and turn it into Star Wars. And Vince Lee did it. And Vince, Vince uh, came up with in the first one he wrote, coded. He's a coder more than he was really a designer. And uh, um, he wrote a, a, a codec so we could do video and and blow it out onto, onto a screen uh, from a file. And, uh, and then, um, so that was a big success for us. Do you remember that moment in the middle 90s when there was just this short moment when there was a concept called multimedia? Yeah. Well, well this, this channel is based on multimedia, okay. given that it's yeah. my partner yeah. is the lead actor from Phantasmagory 2. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and we all went through it. Well, that was what Rebel Assault was, and it was a big hit. Uh, it was, came along just as multimedia got going, and it was a big hit. And so there was no, there was no pitch for Rebel Assault 2. Is we've got to do it. You know, you've got to do another one. And uh, but the, this time I uh, was going to be involved with some more video. And uh, so they wanted me to do it. And, and so we had a little stage right there in, in um, Corte Madeira, right near ILM and where our offices were in the building over from ILM. Um, and um, so we had the costumes that we, from the movies, we could use them. That was cool. And uh, um, we had a big gigantic blue screen, which we were using. We did it all with blue screen and we had a, we had, we had assured ourselves pre-production that we could, you know, extract from a blue screen, uh, you know, digitally, uh, in, in terms of the computer, you know, pull the, pull the foreground off that blue and then stick it back in a, in a background and, and, in a way that would be effective and would actually work. And once we knew that, then that's when we went to work. And so we went to this little studio that did like, food shows, you know, or little uh, sports shows that were like in between seasons, you know, hot stove talk about baseball or, you know, they would have a little table and people would sit there and talk to each other, kind of like ESPN does now. And, and so they had a little studio and they had this big blue screen. And uh, the trouble was it was, it was hard to light. And the guys who lit it were enthusiastic and really wonderful and smart people, but inexperienced getting it all the lit. And we had to get it to a certain level of light or it wasn't going to work. We weren't going to be able to extract the imagery. And I think we spent five days doing this in which, in the middle of which one of our presidents resigned and left the company <laughs> in the middle of production. And one of the 10 people that I worked for in my years there, I just... The management turnover was amazing. Anyway, so the one thing we did do, which was really cool, you know, how are you going to make sure that it, we didn't have motion control? We, we, we couldn't do motion control uh, the way you did in uh, Close Encounters, for example, or with, which Doug Trumbull was involved with. And, you know, uh, we, we just couldn't do stuff like that where you could move the camera and it would know about you know what you were doing. You could reproduce it later and all that stuff. 
So how would we do it? Well, what we did was we had a monitor which we could look at real time and we could uh, shoot our, our, our foreground. We have, have the actors who are gonna do the shot, actually just get in the shot where we kind of knew where the blocking was. You know, here you're gonna be on this X over here, that far from the camera. And then we would, in the monitor, we could live, we could, we could, we could play the background and the foreground together. And we could look and see if the perspective worked. Uh-oh, it doesn't work. So what are we gonna do? Either bring the guys closer to the camera, push them further away, make the camera uh, zoom wider and narrower. And we would just, we would just on the fly, adjust everything so that we knew it was gonna be, the actors would fit in perspective into the shot that we had in the background, which was, was were, were already done. And then we would just, you know, do the takes. And uh, we spent, I think, five days and just every day we'd get like 20 or 30 setups, I guess. It was just grinding through that stuff at really high speed because it wasn't, it wasn't like we were doing drama, you know, where we had to have actors actually talking and acting well. It was mostly just running around. And so it was pretty easy to get it done from a point of view, but there was one wrinkle and that was, um, the guys who were wearing um, uh, Star Troopers uh, uh, costumes, the Star Troopers have these kind of helmet, uh, bell-shaped helmets, right? And they have these visors that are plexiglass that they can see through. Well, the problem is these are costumes, not actual products. And you can't really see really through those goddamn goggles. I don't know how George put up with it actually, because suddenly the, these poor actors couldn't see almost anything. They could sort of barely see. And they would go across the scene. And one of the, one of the things we had to do is get them to go ac across the scene to the entrance, I guess, to the back of a ship. And they would go over there and they would sense that they were getting close to the edge of the set. And instead of just walking boldly up to that and going you know, up to where we were gonna put them in the little ramp, they would slow down and, 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 and get hesitant. So eventually I just said, look, guys, um, don't worry about slowing down. I'll let you know when you're close and it, you'll be fine. And so I just let them run right into the set. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> and it worked. That was the way to do it. Didn't really hurt them. Well done. You know, Sierra Online's Phantasmagoria is uh, another FMV uh, game that came out the same year. And they had the same issues in which they'd film in front of a blue screen. And then in order to know if the actors are standing in the correct place or if the perspective is correct, they'd have a monitor beside them to see. Yep. Just like you guys did. Yep. It worked. It, it was, it was, it was, it was just, uh, it was kind of just hit or miss, it was, but it was kind of the you hold it all welded school of car building, you know, it's just, <laughs> wow. But it, it was it was fun to do. I had a lot of fun doing that and so did everybody else. And we had a lot to talk about because between takes, we'd wonder about what happened to Randy Commissar, our, our, our CEO who had suddenly departed in the middle of it all. And, and this was the first officially filmed Star Wars footage since Return of the Jedi. Yep. And you're the director. Yep. So, yep, that was fun. Now, the following year, Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures came out. And it was an interesting project because it came out at a time when casual games were usually simple games like Solitaire and Free Cell that came bundled with Windows. And other games typically required tens of hours of gameplay to complete. So, how did this project come about and how did how did they get approved back then? Well, I, th I think I mentioned earlier that I, one of the reasons I loved Full Throttle was that it was brief. And I, I had this idea that games should uh, hold your attention, but be brief to play so that you could have a game where you could, you could play the whole darn thing from start to end. You'd actually finish the game, which most people, by the way, in, mo in those days, we would, we would do studies to figure out who played through the games. And most people never finish games, at least in those days. They would just get somewhere along the line and give up. And so I wanted people to finish games. And so I, th I thought brief would also be a, a, a help in that direction. And so I wanted to do a project where we would do very brief games, but how are you gonna get value for money out of that? So you have to make the games replayable. 
So I invented a whole kind of world builder um, uh, system and uh, prototyped it on a Mac uh, using HyperTalk, which is actually a good language. It's kind of like Python. And uh, where it's a verbose, a verbose language where you don't have to do any commenting. It's just you can just read. It's like it's like doing uh, pseudocode, and and so I did it all. It's all recursive and crazy, but HyperTalk was actually a good code. It's a terrible product, but it worked great for my little prototype, uh, which was called Tools of the Tinker's Trade. It was this weird original, and um, and everybody liked it well enough to do something, but. We needed some uh, help, and uh, we went to we went to Microsoft, and they said, "Yeah, we'd be love to sort of do this as a a way to get going on Windows 95 when it comes out." But uh, we we need to have some kind of um, star in it. So Tools of the Tinker Trade went away, and it became Indiana Jones, and it became Indiana Jones as a younger man down in Mexico looking for treasures. And it, it's a it's a wonderful um, little game. Um, it was done before anybody had the generic concept of casual games. Nobody really thought about that, and so they kind of invented them. And um, it, it it didn't sell very well. But and I was excoriated by the critics because I dared to do a tile game and using uh, AAA IP and in, you know intellectual property on this stupid little tile game, and they just thought it was dumb. I thought it was super smart myself. And so, um, you know, uh, the heck with the critics. And the only problem with the game really was that we hadn't, it was experimental. We hadn't quite figured out something, which was we, we learned as we played that game uh, that, uh, woo, there's a problem. You, you, any kind of a puzzle chain, you know, there's always the first thing you have to, you don't have any precedent for it, so you have to find something. And so the first thing is a find and, and you dig around in the various little uh, locations that pop up as you move around to the edges of the each little world, uh, each little section. Um, as you move around, you, you, you can find something. OK, that's the beginning and that will lead you. That's a tool you can use or a thing you can use. It, it either has value as money, let's say, or as a trade item or it's got a, or it's a key of some sort or so whatever, or, you know or something that someone wants and you can trade with someone in the show. And so once you know that, you realize that each one leads to the next one. And, and, and there's only one thing in the game that you should look for uh, because that's going to be the next thing. So if somebody says, hey, I want to trade something, you know that that's what you should be doing. And it made the game a little bit too simple minded. So um, I'm not as fond of the, of uh, Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures as I am of Yoda stories, which was the successor. And Yoda mm -hmm. stories um, has the same world builder, uh, a little more sophisticated, but the same world builder. And it's got, uh, we figured out what we, all we need to do is have two puzzle chains. So that instead of one puzzle chain that leads to the boss area where you're gonna really get in trouble and have to deal with something terrible and shoot him and kill him. Uh, instead, we have two chains. And so when you find something, you don't really quite ever know what the next thing is going to be because you might be on the other chain. And so the result was suddenly there's enough uncertainty and interest to, to make that whole world come alive, that, that double chain. And so when you get to the, the final area where you're going to wind up against uh, Darth Vader or whatever the hell, uh, he, he is in one of them, um, you have to have... Both puzzle, you have to solve two different puzzle chains to get there. You know, one will be probably a key thing to just get in the building, let's say if it's a building, and one of the other ones will be some kind of tool you need when you when you when you you're there as well. Maybe uh, you have to barter with somebody and who will then betray the empire, or whatever. And so that was really uh, made it much more successful. And I still have Yoda stories on my Windows 11 computer, and I play it now and then. <laughs> It's, it's great. You can go through a game in about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other thing we introduced in, in, in that game, which was also beyond desktop adventures, was um, because Luke is a little different than Indiana Jones. He's got lightsabers and guns and stuff. And what we did was uh, we had a campaign system. So there are 15 actual scenarios. And each time you go through five more, you get like an upgrade to your lightsaber if you go talk to Yoda and stuff like that. 
so that we, we introduced a little bit of a campaign uh, RPG-ish kind of element. And so I asked you before, how was it to write a game that had three paths, which was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis? So my question in this case is, how do you as a writer write a script for a game that's basically random every time you start it up? It's and just a, it's how do you keep the story intact and how do you keep everything coherent, even though the game itself is random? Well... Basically, you, you, there is no, there is not much writing that, that that's connected. Um, it's basically a lot of independent dialogues. So if you 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 meet somebody who wants to trade something, you know, oh my gosh, I need a thristal pen. What have you got? You know, I've, I've got this Nova sensor. What you know, the, all the all the objects in the Star Wars universe are basically arbitrary. It's hard to tell one from another. And, and so they're interested in a trade. So that, that could, that, that little teeny episode could appear in any of the, of the games that get built by the world, the world builder. Mm -hmm. And so all you have to do is write the local dialogue tree that's going to go on there. And that's it. It'll always work in whatever section it is. The only thing you have to really know as a writer is construction. It's not, it's not dialogue or, or, or that sort of thing. It's just, What's, what, what are we going to do when we're done? You know, what's, what's the overall story here? Oh, uh, your, your pal Han has been, you know, stuck in a block of plastic and he's been stolen by the Jawas and you got to go, you got to go uh, free him. Or, or, or C-3PO has been stolen by the Jawas and he's been disassembled. And you have to wind up in one of their big track vehicles and find the parts of 3PO and put them back together. Um, and, and so these are scenarios. And that's, that's, the, that's where the writing really is. You had to come up with like 15 of those. So you had the standalone elements that you wrote without any beginning or end. And you had the story arc that had the beginning, had the end. And each and every one of the standalone elements could have been inserted inside that story arc? Yeah, yeah. You, every time you, you, you go, you talk to Yoda. When you, when you land on Dagobah and you're, you, can, you find out that R2 is there and he's always there and you can pick him up. And R2, when you drop him on things, he, he will give you some clues if, he, if there's some stuff that's unusual. You're like, well, no, here's an entrance. You could get in here if you had the right tool or whatever. You know, and so he can provide some advice. And then you run around and you find Yoda. He could be in several little places on, on Dagobah. One of the places is in his little cottage. And you go in there and he will say, Luke, I've got a mission for you. Um, your pal Han, I have no idea why we should worry about him, but he's been stuck, by, you know, captured by the, the Jawas, let's say, or whatever. And, and uh, you need to save him. For some reason, he's important to, to the battle against the Empire. And, and uh, here's something to get you started. And he gives you like a key card or he gives you a magnetic thing, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and off you go. And, and uh, so you get, you get the overview the, the moment you finally get your first thing from Yoda. And, uh, then, and then, then there are a couple other finds you have to do. You have to find a locator, which is how you get to see the world that got built and know where you are in that world and where the puzzles are. So that's, you run around the, the, the whenever there's several different kinds of planets you can land on to begin. There's a desert area, there's a, a forest area, kind of like the Dagobah part, and there's an icy set of worlds. And so there's three different kinds of terrain and that, that, that we had uh, six or 700 little stage areas that you get put together each time. And, and the same thing in, in, in the desktop adventures, but in the desktop adventures, it was simpler because there's only one kind of terrain. It's all Mexican and it varies from deserty to, you know, more wooded or mountainous, but basically it's the same. But we're in, in Yoda stories, you might be in a scenario where everything is going to be kind of icy and cold, or you might be in a scenario where everything is desert. Even though it's being picked randomly, it's from a, from a collection of deserty things. And, um, um, and you just go from there. And so um, you, you, you land on You always land on the initial desert planet. You always land in the initial ice world. And that includes a place where if you get if you get your health down, you can run into a place and uh, one of the Star Wars robots will heal you and, you know, and, and um, so forth. 
And, and so in the case of also, and the other thing you have to go and find in the case of uh, uh, Yoda stories is another nearby, the world builder will always put the locator uh, near, near the initial planet somewhere and also put a, a place where you meet Ben and get the force also somewhere nearby. And so until you get those two things, you, you just really can't function. So you, you run around until you do that and then you work your way out in the world and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it, it does actually do what I wanted it to do, which is it's replayable. It's, it's always, it's, it's replayable in the same way that a game like Stratego or chess is replayable. It's not going to be world shakingly different. I mean, Hey, look, I'm, I'm looking at a 64 squares with all these same little parts on it, you know, all these little pieces. And it's that, that part doesn't change, but the game itself will evolve through very different patterns. Well, you invented casual gaming, which is now a <laughs> multi-million industry. Yeah, I did. I invented one version of it anyway, without knowing other people were also inventing it. You know, there are, there are other people doing stuff, you know, I mean, you know, Oregon Trail, you know, or, or where, in, where, where in the world is, uh, oh God, what's her name? Carmen San Diego. Yeah. And yeah, those are also same, sim similar. They, they, they figured out similar ideas. Three years later, uh, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine was released. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a great fondness for, for this game. But the Me issue too. was that in recent years, running it smoothly has become impossible due to the necessity of altering resolution settings especially in the GOG version. Now, yeah. fortunately, Aaron Giles, whom you may remember from I your do. time at LucasArts, has developed an emulator capable of running this game, along with other LucasArts classics, as native Windows 10 and 11 applications. I got to get it. Now, Where the hell is it? It's in, on his website, AaronGiles.com slash dream. With yeah, double M. yeah, I just, hold on a sec. I'm going to just, oh my God, this is great. Because I'm playing, when no. I play it, I play it um, from GOG. I know. And it's horrible because it changes the resolution. And yep. then the game is um, stretched because nowadays you have wide screens. Yeah. And back then we had four by three screens. So. Yep. Well, when you so play, anyway. when, when you play um, the desktop games, if you don't change the resolution, you have to do it by going into Windows and do, using the control, which allows you to do that. And if you don't horrible. do it, yeah. you know, suddenly you've got a game which is this big, you know, on a screen like this. So you have to change the resolution in order to be able to actually see the game. Our, our, our screens have gotten so big. So I interviewed Aaron Giles back in January when cool. he first released Dream. And then he talked about Dream. And then a few months later, we had a showcase of the first version of Dream, and we played around with various games. And the first thing I told him when he asked me which other games I want uh, Dream to support, I told him that I want Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, because that game didn't run the way I remembered it back in 1999. And so... Uh, a few weeks ago, I think two or three weeks ago, Aaron Giles released the new version of Dream, which includes support for Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures, oh. Yoda stories, and Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, oh, which all run Aaron. as Windows 10 and 11 native applications. This is great. And, this is wonderful. And, yeah. And I even had the pleasure of streaming Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine last Friday as I was testing out the emulator. So I played it, I played around three hours um, oh. of Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine on that emulator, and it ran perfectly. Wow. I'm going to go, I just, it was, when, when we hang up, the first thing I'm going to do is run over there and get that and give it a shot because I think that's really interesting. I guess, though, yeah. whereas, whereas I guess, I, I think I've downloaded from GOG the actual game but of course you have to you have to still be connected up and i'm wondering where i'm going to go i have to go dig around and see if i've still got discs that have no you don't need the discs the, the um uh, aaron giles's emulator requires the executable files but fortunately the gog version has the executable files so you can just download the emulator and point it towards the folder to, 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 to that the gog, GOG installed, and it works perfectly i'll give it a shot Wow, 
wow, I love that. I love uh, an infernal machine in spite of the fact that I couldn't play it for years after we did it because it, it, it rapidly looked really primitive. But, you know, it was made in the days when Tomb Raider was stealing our thunder as, a, you know, an action adventure hero. And I wanted to be I wanted to, to kind of take back some of that stage from mm-hmm. wonderful, wonderful Lara Croft. I have played all those games, of course. And um, um, and I also admired in those days, it was a very brave thing for a Toby guard to do to create a woman avatar for a, an audience that was almost going to be entirely male. And how would they feel over this sort of gender bending kind of thing? Everybody loved it. And uh, his people objected back and then, you know, feminism has gone beyond all this stuff. But in those days, the fact that Toby gave her these, you know, pyramid shaped boobs, uh, you know, bothered a lot of a lot of women. And but nowadays, nobody even thinks about it. And um, she's just a wonderful character. Uh, it's 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 and and the, it was wonderful what they did because they had a much better idea for how to do 3D in a primitive way, which because they had basically three dimensional tiles, they had cubes, and except for Lara herself, who had all these elegant animations, you know, when she would when she would climb up a cliff, every now and then she'd pull herself up and do a tumble off, you know, and, and you know that kind of stuff, and just beautiful. And, and it's interesting how those animations were retained in a, in a Lara Croft show called uh, um, Tomb Raider Go. Have you ever, have you ever seen that thing where you do all these little sort of technical puzzles with her? And mm-hmm. everything else is very, very um, uh, axonometric uh, perspective kind of stuff. And, and But her animations are all just like from the, from the games. Fantastic. Anyway, so we wanted to do some of that stuff. And I couldn't play the game for years because it just was so primitive. And um, uh, uh, when we were doing the, the engine, which we did ourselves, which is always a big mistake at LucasArts because we're not really that big a company. We should have been buying stuff instead of building it. And uh, we were using Euler angles uh, to, to do the 3D uh, stuff. So you had to be careful with gimbal lock. And we were not able to uh, re- ever solve the problem of Indy and his hips, really. So eventually he had to give him a spinal fusion and that made him look kind of awkward. And we could never get his hip to whip to crack properly because you know, Euler angles were going all over the place and suddenly you'd get gimbal lock and the whip would look like a knot. And, you know, it was, it was, it was just terrible. And, and, and the one thing that we did do eventually, the, the, the company decided that they wanted to do uh, a Nintendo uh, 64 version of this thing. And they just, it was just going to be a rental and this is just full of bugs. It never really worked very well. And uh, Nick Pavis was the programmer working for uh, Factor 5. They wanted me out of it and because uh, I'm so persnickety. And um, But eventually they came back to me because they needed to do save games. And I showed them how to do instead of 50K worth of save games in the PC version, how to do 128 bytes and still get good get good save games because we could put the text of the save game mostly in the actual code, and it was, which was very compact. And uh, when you hit the save game, it, was, it would just remember which doorway you were going to be at and to go through. And it would, we would do it in a very compact way. So I helped them do all that. But Nick figured out something, which is he did it with quaternions. He would just on the fly take take the the Euler angle stuff, and before he displayed it, just turn it into quaternions, do the display, and then throw them away. In the next frame, he would build quaternions again and throw them away, and it, it worked great. <laughs> Too bad that we never figured that out, because because the in those days, you know what was the what was the sixty four? It was a sixty. 65816, 16, 60, right? It was a super duper version of the 6502 running in there. So it was nothing like as powerful as a PC. We could have just, we could have done it. We never did. Anyway, that all bothered me for years. But then eventually, you know, instead of looking antique, uh, Infernal Machine just looks retro. And I fell mm-hmm. in love with it again. So 
it's like watching movies from the 90s <laughs> back then you'd look at the cgi and it seemed dated even back then but nowadays you appreciate the fact that you can see the outline of the cgi <laughs> and the frame itself is a bit grainy because they had to composite it in a weird way like they did back then and yeah. digital compositing was not as good and so it has its uh, virtues now a thing that i like about this game and that I also like about Fate of Atlantis was the fact that you nailed the character of Indiana Jones. Many people consider Fate of Atlantis as the official fourth Indiana Jones movie. Wow. And to me, Infernal Machine uh, serves as the fifth wow. Indiana Jones movie. Oh, well, you're very nice. In terms, yeah. of, in terms of nailing the char character, you nailed it perfectly. Wow, thanks. And, 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 the, and the game itself brings a familiarity that you have with the original trilogy. And with this game, you also bring familiarity to the universe you've created with the return of Sophia Hapgood and the mm -hmm. return of Doug Lee as Indiana Jones. Yep. yep. It. And so I wanted to thank you for that. Wow, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the kind words. Um, it's nice to know that this, I'm not the only person who thinks it's a neat game, you know? Well, you know, I, I put Aaron Jaws on the spot. I usually put people on the spot in my conversation. So I put him on the spot that I want the Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine support in the next version of Dream. So. Well, that's great. Yeah. I'm going to run out and get that thing. I just, I, I can't wait. It's one of the things that I like the most. And when I played through it two or three years ago, it was before the pandemic. So probably 18 or so, something like that. I suddenly mm -hmm. thought, you know, hey, Gog's got this game. I should look at it. I, I fa got fascinated by it again. It was looking pretty good uh, when I played it. It didn't seem to have any hitches or anything. And um, anyway, what, what struck me about the game wasn't so much the overall story, although I still think it's wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I love the cooperative puzzles we were able to do with Sophia. You know, that let, you haven't seen that again until you get to The Last of Us. You know, and, and so um, I thought that was really a terrific accomplishment that we did. And um, anyway, um, I, I, I mostly thought about the level design. All these kids that did that level design that were kind of at the beginnings of their careers just turned out some of the most brilliant levels that I've ever seen in a game. And they had a lot of coaching from their project leader, Mr. Howe. But uh, but some some of them some of them like Reed uh, Reed Knight was having a terrible time with uh, Maraway, but eventually with some with help it just turned into this fabulous level. It's almost like a whole game in itself, running around those pyramids and 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 killing scorpions with your jeep, you know, running over bad guys. It's just great. Anyway, um, and but on the other hand, uh, another guy who just came up from test, uh, Tim Miller. Uh, you know, he just, you know, okay, I think I can help you. And I showed him, he got to do the level where you're, you're running around on a railroad. And every now and then you got to go back to the central area and pull switches to switch the tracks to get to everything you need to get to. And um, Tim is a kind of a, a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, tough guy. Uh, his, his, his email is mean streak at something or other, you know, and Tim's a little bit like that. And I thought, oh, my God, I've got this kid who's going to just run over me and he'll be terrible and I'll have to wrangle with him to get the level to work the way I wanted to. He just took everything I wanted to happen and just made it like 10 times better. He, he was just an immense talent out of the box. And, and that's just one of the one of the two of the levels that are just super terrific. And a lot of them, oddly enough, in the same way that when I play um, the Zelda game um, uh, Ocarina of Time, there is there are some moments in there where you've finally gotten the horse, and you can you can be on a horse, and you can go through these strange woods where there's trees but no underbrush, but you have some sort of weird feeling of actually being in this sort of magical world, and there are moments in in, in Jones that are like that. There's there's one level where you you come upon this huge, long canyon and you first get there from coming through a tunnel and you come out at the edge of the tunnel and you're looking down upon this huge canyon. 
And it's like that. It has that same experience. It's like you're actually, even though the, the, the actual graphics are pretty primitive, you still get that feeling of space and being in a world. And I, I found that to be wonderful. Now, is it true that in your original vision you wanted the game to take place in the 1950s during the Cold War with the uh, Roswell UFO incident yes, service? Yes, as oh, the yes, game's that's begotten? absolutely true. And and I, 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 I when I went to when I went to um, the management of the company to say, listen, hey guys, look at these Tomb Raider games. We've got we're Indiana Jones, and we're the, the, they 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 copied us. Let's let's take a, let's take back. Our franchise and uh, they said okay and 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 uh, what do you want to do and and uh, they knew I was going to come up with a story and I didn't really have it I just had the idea of the of the Roswell incident and and getting rid of the Nazis was the main thing I wanted to do I don't want to do that again I, I want to take Jones into the the next step and I still don't understand why the latest movie is put him back with the Nazis again after they out of their minds anyway um, so I, I wanted to do that, and I proposed a, quite of a complete story about it. And it had to go before review at Lucasfilm. And they said, don't go there. We are reserving this. And I thought, oh, darn. Well, at least it's cool, because maybe that means they're going to make a movie about this stuff. It'll be great. And uh, yeah, so what you wish for. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It became Crystal Skull. Oh, Christ. <laughs> but anyway, so then I thought, okay, what am I going to do? I've got to find something from the ancient world that, that could work. And so I went to Babylon and the Tower of Babel and uh, Marduk, you know, all that stuff and, uh, and, and put it together that way. But it still takes place in the 50s. It doesn't have Nazis. It's got a Cold War theme. And the only thing that's funny is at the end of the, at the, end of the, of the game when you're done, you, you walk away with uh, Volodnikov, you know, and, and you're kind of pals. And meanwhile, on the way to get there, if you're like me, you probably killed 250 Russians in the, in the process. <laughs> That's just the way it worked. Well, it seems that the, the idea to have UFOs was originally conceived in 1995. They had a draft, Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men from Mars. So that's why they rejected your proposal. Yeah. Yep. Well, now, were there any particular difficulties or challenges associated with working on the game, given that it utilized the Sith engine, which was originally developed for Dark yes. Forces 2? Yes. Which was a first person shooter. There, that's the problem. It was a first person game. They had no idea how to do character animation, really. And so turning it into a third person uh, game, which I, you know, I thought. You know, it's one thing to do third-person, sh first-person shooters if you're if you're essentially an, an anonymous character. That that works, and I've played a lot of those things. You know, you're uh, even even when you're even when you're sort of have a name. You know, it, it, you know if you're one of those bungee games or whatever. You know, you're not really a character. You know, you know who is Master Chief? No one's ever figured that out, and 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 um, so that that kind of works. But when you have a, a, a an avatar who's who's very famous in, and with his own persona and his own brings with him a sense of adventure and so forth, you, it has to be for third person. You've got to see that guy. In the same way you identify with a character on screen, in order to identify with an actual recognizable character in a game, he's, he's got to be up there. So it had to be third person, and we had to adapt the Sith engine, which worked great for Dark Forces. But it was it was hell on earth to get that to work uh, for us, and it was it was complicated by the fact that uh, Paula Fever, who was our, our our lead programmer, a wonderful guy, and and he did a good job ultimately. But Paul is married to a woman from the Philippines, and uh, she was having a terrible time. Uh, they they had to go back to the Philippines. They let her back into the country, and she was stuck in the Philippines. And Paul was in a terrible, terrible mental stress during the whole project. And it was tough. And, it was, and so it, there was a lot of sick leave going on. And it was just very hard to get it done. And, and as, as I already mentioned, we never did solve some of the problems with uh, the fact that we were using Euler angles. We should have been using quaternions from the beginning. We didn't understand that. And, and by the time we were trying to get it released, it was just you know really hard to 
to incorporate those things. And we didn't really have the idea that we could use them and just throw them, um, uh, which was too bad for us. Uh, the other thing that was going on was um, uh, in those days, we were, we were pushing, the best we could do was about 5,000 polys a frame. So it has that cardboardy look and, and you know, you can't help that. Um, it was before you could buy plugins that would do wonderful lip sync to just look at the text and do lip sync, which you can now do and, and you could do five years later. Um, so our characters don't actually talk, really. They just kind of talk, but they don't talk. And uh, so that was a problem. And um, the, the, the world, the level design tool uh, that was, it was primitive enough. So the level designers themselves were doing the art. And uh, I actually did a little bit to see, you know, to see what it would be like to, to run that thing. And that was kind of tough on them to, to learn that skill and get it to work right. I'm amazed when I look back at it now that it looks as good as it does, you know? And so those were all big production problems. The getting the engine done was the main problem. It was touch and go right till the end. And I also, um, the sense of craftsmanship on the on the team varied quite a bit. So that there were some people like uh, Tim or or Reed who who would just go crazy, or uh, or Steve Chen who were you know just really attentive to all the details, and some of our other level design guys, you know, really really weren't that interested in you know things like uh, camera scenes. You know, we did some cut scenes, and uh, you know, getting getting the camera to aim where it's supposed to aim is, is often terrible. And I, and so I, I learned enough 3D stuff so that a lot of the ways that doors are opening and closing and how they stay closed when they're supposed to stay closed and open when they're supposed to open or when the camera is aimed and how it tracks, I had to go running in there myself and learn all the level design stuff and all the code. And so I, I, I spent a lot of time doing low level coding in that game. But we also, in the middle of it all, we, we, we had, um, uh, um, oh, geez. Don Silky was a guy, he was another older, older guy. I never really accepted that well socially because he was an older guy. He was a Navy guy down in Pensacola who was doing mods on like Dark Forces. And he sent them to Lucasfilm and, and they said, oh my God, let's hire you. And he came along and he, he, he was one of those guys that was rough and ready, but he could turn out stuff at tremendous high speed so we got to do there's a wonderful level in the in the game uh where you just are in the jeep and you're just running all over the place uh, around a complicated maze and you wind up at the end going off a ramp and getting picked up in a helicopter don just turned that level out in like no time and he could do all the c code in two seconds to get all, to get everything to work right so that was a great pleasure to work with because he just would do it he, he would just look at my diagrams and my bubble diagrams Oh yeah, okay, bing, and suddenly you've got the level. It was great. I also talked to Bill Diller and Anson Chu about the game. Bill Diller was the lead artist, and yes, I Bill was about great. The concept art, and Anson Chu, he talked to me about the the two D animations that he made for the game. the um, The smoke animation, I learned that it was two D. Yeah, just they were just, they were, they were just yeah. imposters in the game. Yep, and. And the way that he made the ocean or the lakes water move. Yeah. And um, with an X turning into a circle and a circle turning into an X. You know, I never understood that. It was, it was, I was just, I was just always thankful that something happened. <laughs> but in case back of then Bill. I had to upgrade, back then I had to upgrade my graphics card to play uh, Indiana Jones. Wow. Um, well, yeah. Um, on the other hand, Bill. Bill, Bill is, was a Photoshop wizard and a terrific sketch artist and also with ambitions to be a designer. And, and so he, he, was, he was a kind of a tricky guy to, to work with a little bit, but he did some fantastic concept art for us. Just wonderful. And in an era when LucasArts had no idea that you needed a concept artist because the level designers themselves would just kind of put things together but, but usually from a sketch that, that Bill had done. And, and when we shipped the game, we took all Bill's concept arts and I put a logo on the upper corner of them, you know, and we shipped them with the game. So you have this wonderful catalog of his co concept art. It's just terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, but later when I did RTX Red Rock, 
now now we're dealing with instead of pushing 5,000 polys, even on the anemic PlayStation 2, um, we we're pushing 25,000 or 30,000 a, a, a frame. And so suddenly the level designers were not capable of actually turning out art that you, you could use in a game. And so if you didn't have concept art, you were dead because it was so complicated to, to do the level design. It was so complicated to do the actual 3D structures that you needed to do that you, if you didn't have the concept art, you'd spend half the time just erasing stuff and trying to re, re, re put new stuff in. You know, it just was so laborious to do those levels. So concept art suddenly became a career at LucasArts, but we were already doing it before with Bill. It's funny that a company like Lucasfilm that came from the movie industry doesn't understand the concept of concept art. No, you know, when it came nowadays, uh, I have, I have uh, colleagues in the, in, the, in the game developer uh, group that I'm a part of who are, you know, system designers. Nowadays, you know, the, the whole design world has been, you know, broken up in, into various specialties and system design where you're doing the economics of the game really has become a specialty. And in and, and the era of Jones, you know, and, and all the games we were doing, I was the systems designer as well as everything else. You know, I just did it. And, and nowadays, you really can't do that anymore. You, you know, it's just uh, that's part of the, the, the higher demand uh, that, that modern games have. And it's part of the, um, it's not a technical advance, but it's a production advance. It's, it's a way of which the world of game development has matured in the same way that, you know, I don't think that when movies started, that there was a concept of key grip and dolly grip, you know, the, the, those, those specialties evolved and eventually, okay, woo, there's this guy who knows how to move that, the, the dolly around and he's a dolly grip, you know, and he wears sneakers. Everybody else wears, uh, you know, bob, hobtail boots. <laughs> and, and that became a specialty. And I think that the, the world of game development, and it's kind of an advance of just how production has become rationalized and careers have become streamed. I, I think that's really an interesting development. And that's the maturation of the world of, of game development. Now, speaking of RTX Red Rock, and uh, the game celebrated its 20th anniversary last month. Yep. What can you tell us about that project? Uh, I, all I can tell you is that it, it was an enormous commercial failure. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I love that game. It's, a, it's a, I think, a wonderful game. But there are two things about it that I, I, I would do differently if I were doing it again. I didn't realize that my taste for lightheartedness did not translate well into a game where you've got a hard-nosed guy shooting things. And a lot of the players rebelled against that. They rebelled against the fact that the hero of Red Rock is an intelligent guy as well as a tough guy. They didn't like his wit. When we did, did focus group stuff, they said, oh, you got a hero in a pink suit. A ah, college guy. You know, they didn't, they didn't go for that. And so I, 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 would have, I would have done something different, but I'll tell you even more about that. It's, uh, it's really interesting for me. Um, so there was, there's that problem. The other problem is that I was building, uh, as you know, uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is kind of a chapter game. You go from a bubble here where you're in Morocco, you go to Italy, I mean, Algiers, you go to Italy, you go to Crete, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it actually, you bounce around a little bit because sometimes you have to go back and forth. But yeah. um, nevertheless, it's, 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 it's not exactly an open world. You, you get kind of vectored from place to place. And of course, Infernal Machine is a chapter story, as was Rebel Assault, for that matter, you know, Vince, Vince's game. And uh, uh, so I was interested in that. And, and, I, and Red Rock is also a chapter game. But I realized, actually, in the middle of production that we were making a mistake because everybody is going to go follow the, the Zelda model, which is you have an open world or, or, for that matter, GTA, where you have a world that's open. The only problem is at the moment, the bridge is out over here and you got to get the bridge back before you can go to that section of the world. And we didn't organize it like that. And that, that turned out to be considered to be old fashioned. 
and I still like chapter games. I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, narrative and uh, made a big comeback when Last of Us turned out to be a big hit. And both as a game and uh, there's a reason why it got translated into a, a, a very big hit uh, streamer. And that's because it is linear. It's, it's a narrative story. And I, I'm still interested in that stuff, but I would have certainly done it differently. But the main thing I would have done differently is I, I was kind of... In order to get that game rolling, um, uh, it was interesting. I was I was actually uh, sitting around after Jones Infernal Machine, and um, I was trying to come up with uh, uh, the next thing. And uh, I had two ideas. One of them, which, which I sort of wish I'd built, was a first-person shooter. There was a bunch of aliens that actually have infested and taken over. Uh, was secretly a building in Manhattan, a gigantic tall building. And the game would be you shoot your way through the levels all the way up to the hundredth floor, you know, and, and it's, 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 you know, getting the aliens and it's, it's sort of like, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of those, um, I'm trying to remember the, the wonderful old movie where the pod people come out and take over, you know, everybody or the, or the science fiction movies where people had, little implants in the back of their neck, you know, and, 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 and it was kind of like that. And that would have been a wonderful shooter. And, and I probably should have built it. And the other thing I wanted to do was Red Rock, but the original concept for Red Rock, which I wish to God I had done was that the hero of the game wasn't a guy from earth who was a commando, you know, a special forces ace. Instead, he was about a 15 year old, maybe a 16 year old kid who had a terrible accident and, uh, and injured his arm and was uh, deported by the authorities on, the, on Mars to get the hell back to Earth. You're, you're, you're dangerous here. And so they sent him up to wait for a trip back to the Phobos station. And then the aliens show up and he's this kid up there and the guys on Earth say, oh my God, we've got to We've got to uh, get rid of these guys. And who have we got out there? Okay, this kid. Okay, you know what? You're a you're a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. Get down there and go get them. And he goes down and he meets uh, you know so, uh, Rajan, and uh, and they they become a team. And the idea of having a kid who has to grow up in this in the role would have been a very interesting character. And I think it would have been a lot more interesting to the. To the, to the guys who resented this uh, smart guy who turned out to be this uh, special forces guy. When your audience has problems with smart guys, may, maybe the problem is the audience and not the character. Well, maybe. I, the, the, fu the funny thing is I know some Navy SEALs and they're not what you think. I know the two of them and they're, they're, they're first of all, they're gentlemen. They're very well educated. They're not jocks. That's the weird part. Uh, seals are another world that you just don't really know. And I, I had that knowledge when I created the character who was in the, in the, in the game. So I knew a lot more than those, those guys who didn't like him. On the other hand, I made a mistake. There's no doubt. But the other problem really was that we were stressed to get it done. And by, by now we're, we're talking about, you know, 2000, 2001, 2003, there were, there, were, there were engines available we could have purchased. They would have been good, um, but we didn't. We built one and it was a mistake to do it. We thought we were a big company. We were a small company and we had resource problems getting that stuff done. Eric Johnson, who was my lead, is a brilliant programmer, uh, uh, terrific and he, but the thing is that when it comes to the world of programming, if someone is an ace like Eric, uh, and then you have a, someone else coming along who's also a programmer, but talented, but not an ace, the difference in their work product output, it'd be like five to one. It's not, it's not like you get a little bit more done if you're really good. You get like tons more done. And so it became very, very hard to get that engine finished. And we ran into all sorts of troubles. You know, for example, uh, it became eventually that we had each track on the DVD was a different version of the level so that so that when you came in from A, it would it would play this track because that was the only way we could establish all the stuff that needed to happen when you open doors and then exposed more more polys to the to the engine, you know, that kind of stuff. 
And Eric managed to solve that. But then even then we would find that you would go through a door and some of the resources just weren't on that track. Oh my God. So we had to have programmers who came in with a, with a scripting language, which actually was just C. We actually took our scripting language and compiled it right into the code. It's the only time I've ever, well, two times I've ever written code that actually worked off the processor. And one of them was doing the, doing the scripting language for Redrock where it was just C. And we would have to go and go through a list of, oh, what isn't here? Here's a little list of when this door opens, bring these resources, you know, that kind of stuff, especially for every door in the whole damn game. So I had three programmers who were just doing that. And uh, we had to hire them and get him on the show in the middle. So that was really tough. And um, it, was, it was very hard to get our work done. Now, the company wasn't very happy with me because we went six months late. So we blew our advertising uh, pre-sales and all that stuff. And, um, and the, only, the only thing is that although <laughs> I, I was a little bit late, everybody working on the other projects in the company were like a year and a half late. So I looked good by comparison, but that didn't do me any good with the, with management. And uh, so we, we parted company on cordial, but slightly unfriendly terms. And that same year, Indiana Jones and the Empress Tomb came out. What do you think about that game? I didn't go for it. I, I understand things... that you had the, the original concept for the game and they ignored it. Is no, that right? I, no, I, I didn't have the original. They, they, there's somebody else that they were doing this uh, with, a, with a studio outside the company, but they handed mm -hmm. me the story concept and I looked at it and said, Hey guys, you have, just have no idea what you're doing. And, um, so I, I, one of the things you have to learn, you know, there's a, there's a mantra, you know, that, that, that you learn. You know, the, the beginner thinks that there are many possibilities. The expert knows there are a few. And the people who were going to do Emperor's Tomb were, were the beginners who knew there were many possibilities. And I'm one of those guys who knows there aren't that many. And, and I was trying to clean up their story. I was trying to streamline it so it would just work coherently. And they, they just didn't pay any attention. They just wanted to, they, they, they just, they wanted to, they thought of story as a playpen where they could run around and uh, we want to do this. This will be cool. We want to do that. That'll be cool. And uh, they were right about the cool part, but they were wrong about how it all fit together. Anyway, not, not a fan of any of those. Now, so you parted ways with LucasArts immediately after RTX well, Red Rock? I didn't exactly. I, the, the, we thought there was going to be another Jones game. And by now they thought, well, okay, maybe you'll write it but they thought that I shouldn't be a project leader. Now, part of that wasn't just that Red Rock was a commercial failure, which it certainly was, even though I still love that game. Every now and then I, every now and then I have a PlayStation 2, it still works. And every now and then I, I, I give it a try. It's fun. And uh, it was also the fact that I wanted to get things done well. Now, LucasArts started out being like that as, as being kind of a, a first class studio where we're, we're good at what we do and we are, we take quality seriously. But gradually over time, it, 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 the company evolved away from that thought and they just wanted to publish stuff, get it out there, the hell with it. And, uh, I think they were influenced by the fact that George, George was very persistent. It was interesting how, uh, George and Steve, Steve Spielberg uh, is, is a game fanatic and he's unbelievably good at it. I can remember in the old days when we would all go down to the arcades uh, with Steve and we'd play eight way tank and kill, Steve would kill us all. He, he was just a fantastic game player. And he, 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 when he was at Amblin at, at Universal, he had a whole room there of just video game, ar arcade games. They were all just filling the, the ante room. George has never played a game himself, but Steve has got James, DreamWorks um, uh, uh, Interactive going and then gave up. George, who has never played a game actually, was very persistent and kept it going, which is really interesting how they differed. But the problem is that George had a board of directors of Lucasfilm, I think, who were business people in the world of uh, computers and banking and so forth, but not creative. And uh, as a result of that, they just wanted to see the bottom line. And the result of that was that gradually 
uh, uh, Lucas just wanted to get the games done and shove them out the door. And they didn't like the fact that I really wanted to polish them up, make sure they worked well. So they were happy to say goodbye. Me too. And what did you do after you left LucasArts? Well, I became kind of a freelancer uh, for a while. And uh, I guess another 10 years or so. And uh, every now and then I'd work on a game. I, I wound up working on uh, the only other adventure game, really, that I ever did was Matahari with a uh, now defunct company in Germany, DTP Entertainment, um, mm -hmm. uh, Cranberry Studios, which uh, was a reincarnation of a bankrupt version of DPP's original uh, studio. And um, that was an interesting experience, but it was very frustrating. And the, the game is not a big success. It's okay. And I did the story and wrote it. And uh, um, uh, with Noah, actually, we, that's the other time we worked together, actually. And we did the design together, kind of. And then um, I uh, took over and did the screenplay, uh, like 500 pages of stuff. And, and uh, the problem was that the studios in Germany needed to get the art done. And so they would just do the art and, and say, well, fit the puzzles in here. And it's like, what? <laughs> it was just, it was, it was crazy. But it was it was fun to go over there and, and meet all those people. It was just great. But um, so that was that was uh, one of the things I did, and and I worked a little bit on uh, on other games. And then I, I began to realize that, <clears throat> that what soured me ultimately was this kind of um, problem that I've noticed that other freelancers that are friends of mine have gone through as well, which is the catch twenty two of being a freelance game designer, and um, and that is that. Um, the people who know how to make use of your services, you know, I'm an experienced game designer. I've done a lot of stuff, um, uh, don't need your services. And the people who need your services really don't have any idea how to use them and don't understand them and don't respect them. So that, that's kind of the, that's, that's the downside of being a freelance game developer right there. And I've had a lot of experience going through that. The other thing I had fun with a little bit was back in the days when Zynga and social games were a big deal. I was invited by a friend of mine who was also a freelancer who was working with Zynga to come and help on a game that they were building in Boston, which was uh, Jonesy. And uh, it, it didn't involve Jones, it was, but it was Jonesy. So I, I went back there and it was it was it was funny because the the guys who were sort of running the company you know tested me you know it was it was interesting I had to go through a test they they gave me a little problem and I had to come up with sort of a a game concept to, to show that I knew what I was doing and they said okay okay so I I spent some time you know with some of the guys there who had just come out of Carnegie Mellon and were in Boston and and um, uh, among them a wonderful guy who's uh, named Seth Sivak who was kind of running that, the head of that group that was doing that, that, that um, game and who eventually uh, left that company to start Proletariat, which is doing these kind of Twitch sidebar games. And then I think he sold them to, I think he sold them to Blizzard. I think he sold Proletariat to Blizzard. And Seth is in our, our design group now because I got him in there. And, and, and it was, so that was a wonderful experience. And I got to help them figure out level design and, and how to do the social moments where you have to get your friends to help you up the ladder and all the things you have to buy. And I learned about, you know, social games where the project leader doesn't run it. It's the, it's the person who's looking at how you're going to make money, who's running how everything works and how much it costs to, to, to buy that ladder that you want to use to get up the cliff. But what was interesting is that the game was never a big success at all, but eventually they connected up with Lucasfilm and they turned it into an Indiana Jones game. And uh, it lasted for a while, but then they sunsetted it. And uh, that was the beginning, I think, of when Zynga started a spiral downward. And what was their contribution in terms of plot? Uh, well, my, my basic contribution wasn't so much in, in terms of plot. It was just in terms of a streamlining a lot of ideas for their for their level designs and the little problems that they would have to solve you know uh, you know uh, like just stupid things like you can't get across the stream so you have to break a dam you know or some st stuff like that you know just a, a whole suite of things that were uh, you know puzzly puzzly uh, the things you had to do to advance the game and that could incorporate elements 
that you would have to buy, literally, you know, in, in app purchases in order to be able to break that dam or reroute the reroute the uh, the the water into a well, so that someone who was trying to make a living out in the desert would be able to help you do something else, that kind of stuff. And so they were they were appreciative of that. And it was fun to do, and I, I it was a big education for me because I, I have never really actually played uh, a, a social game up until that point. There's, Nothing seemed to me that would be more boring in life than doing a farm game, you know? And yet friends of mine who were at Singa would show me, hey, Hal, you want to see a $30,000 farm? And they would show me a picture of somebody who spent $30,000 on their farm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it seems that most adventure games use the narrative as their core mechanic. Yeah. And they stopped using puzzles as much as they did back then. Well, do you feel that uh, there, this is the natural progression of games, or do you think that there is too much hand-holding nowadays in games? Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting is I, I'm married to my childhood sweetheart. We've been married a very long time. And uh, one of the odd things is, of course, I'm a game nut, and she is not. But one day, I was uh, in the middle of playing an adventure game that I, that I was working on, and I had to look at it for some other professional reason. Some of the, okay, we've done this game and we want to work on something. So take a look at that and we'll get going. And I was looking at it and my wife comes by my chair and goes boing and came over and she was very, very interested in that game. And so after a while, we started playing adventure games together. And what that means these days is you go up on online and you buy things that are, you know, made in Port Poland or something, you know, and all these companies that build these, these modern casual adventure games. We've done dozens of them. And um, you're absolutely right about your, your analysis of, of the overall pattern. And uh, my friend Lee Sheldon, who's a former um, Star Trek writer and a, a very famous game guy, also in my game group. And you know, Lee's, uh, Lee's way of thinking about it is, uh, well, modern adventure games are an interactive story with speed bumps. And, and that's kind of true. I mean, the puzzles are usually very simple, very straightforward, and mostly they involve every now and then turning into a mini game. There are various kinds of mini games. Some of them are very inventive. Some of them are a lot of fun. And, uh, and usually they're the, the thing that sells them and makes them uh, viable are, are beautiful graphics that they, that they can hire people in low wage countries to produce where you have a lot of talent that they will work for very low amounts of money, either in Poland or maybe, maybe the Czech Republic or Ukraine, actually. And uh, um, so, so that seems to be how, how that works. And I'm not sure it's a natural progression. I find it attractive. I'm a guy, remember, who did uh, Yoda stories and, and uh, desktop adventures. So I, I, like, I like to be engaged in games. I don't necessarily like very stiff challenges. So, um, uh, you know, um, I, I, I kind of like games like that. So I, I appreciate the fact that some of those things are happening. And I also, of course, went right through uh, Thimbleweed Park, which is Ron Gilbert's game, and uh, which is an old, uh, uh, literally designed on purpose to be a retro game, kind of like the old LucasArts games. And I, you know, my wife wouldn't go near it, of course. You know, it, it's got all those old LucasArts, very serious puzzles. And you've got to do some serious thinking and try to get your mind around, you know, Ron's weirdo uh, attitude toward things. And, and Dave Grossman, too, who was also working on it. I think David Fox also worked on that game. And, you know, I, I, I finished it. It was it's fun. And it was it was a visit to the past. You know, it was it was wonderful. But um, it's very much at variance with the kind of things that, you know, sell a lot now. And um, um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I think adventure games are kind of, a, you know, solving puzzles and whether they're jigsaw puzzles or adventure games, you have this sense of accomplishment, like you built something. And mm -hmm. I just feel like when you've solved everything, you've gotten to the end, you just have this sense of that you have you built something, you've, 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 you've done a construction. And so you feel proud of it. You feel proud of your accomplishment. And I think that's one of the rewards of adventure game playing, uh, as opposed to shooters, where you just want to, you know, get that damn boss monster. And um, 
Anyway, I presume I presume you know the game Firewatch, which is basically a walking sim. One of my favorite, the... one of my favorite games of all time. You know, it's just one of yeah. those games that you play, and it's just like, oh my god. The only thing is, I, I love that game. I've played it several times, and uh, uh, it is one of the very few first-person games, mostly first-person. You get to see feet now and then, you know, mm -hmm. as you scramble down a cliff. And, uh, um, but it's, uh, it's just an absolutely wonderful game, wonderful, wonderful game. And the, and I love the fact that it's, it's human, you know, you've got, it, it's, it's, you're running around on your own in the middle of nowhere. And you're this, your, your, your wife is this demented woman who's down in Australia now, and it's all over and it's, oh my God, you're depressed. So you go off and live on your own for a summer in 1986 in the middle of Wyoming. And, um, and you and you and you make friends with this woman in a fire tower about five miles away. And at the end, you she rescues you and you get in the helicopter, but you never get to see her. And I thought you made a terrible mistake because if you you should there are, there are ways where you can talk to each other in different ways, and they could have elaborated that a bit. And depending on how co close a friend you get to be, you get to see her or you don't get to see her at the end. It was so mm -hmm. simple. And the other thing that bothers me about that game is um, Campo Santo got bought by Valve and they all went away from the next game they were doing and they're just helping Valve now. Ah, too bad. So what do you think of Firewatch? I really like Firewatch. We started streaming it um, two weeks ago. I've played it um, already all the way through and I really love this game, but you know, I still miss the puzzles from the 90s. The fact that you... Yep. These games yep. are called walking sims because you basically walk around the environment and experience the narrative through various objects and interactions along the way. And instead of puzzles, you just have branching narratives. Yeah, And, and you instead have of dialogues, you have two bad choices and five seconds to choose one yeah. of them. Yeah, and, and, and that's all true, actually. It's a game though where you become immersed in a in a, a world, and I love the fact that the world you know here you're it's Firewatch so yeah I'll be damned eventually there is a fire, you know and so so you so there's a coherent progress that does go through, but you're right it's mostly just being in that world, and learning the landmarks and you know and and understanding how to get around efficiently in that world and oh, if I want to go over there I got to remember don't go down the cliff. Go down through the woods. Go over here, and um, and every now and then it's implausible. You know, uh, your friend in the fire tower leaves a, a recording for you down in a, a a cache, which is miles from either you or her. You know, it's like how did she get there? You know, what the hell? And um, and the the guy who's lurking around that sort of beat up your uh, your tower and, and vandalized it and so on and so forth and threw your typewriter out and all that stuff. Um, I, I found that part of the story not really believable. How did he stay alive in the woods all that time? And I, I thought they could have done more to show that this guy has a, a, become a feral, like Bigfoot weirdo. And, and, and that, that, that could have been much more menacing and, and interesting, I thought. And, I, and like you, I sort of missed some of the puzzles. But I was having such a good time running around in that world and a little bit like Fortnite, they had a tremendously good idea graphically, which was do uh, 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 graphics that show you a world that you believe is a world, but do it in a painterly aesthetic. So you don't have to worry too much about whether this is cutting edge, you know, um, graphics. It's, it's, it was a great, uh, great graphics decision. And just so it's a beautiful game as well as a, a wonderful time to play, I thought. Now, one interesting aspect that I wanted to ask you about was what is your interpretation of the intriguing situation where you and Steven Spielberg, both working in Hollywood, possess a strong passion for working on computer games, while George Lucas, who owned the game company, primarily devoted his time to movies? Well... George didn't just, re 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 you know, George, it's really interesting. I don't think George could open up a laptop and even start it himself personally. 
Uh, he just doesn't do stuff like that, but he knows what computers are good for. And, and so, for example, b- uh, before it was purchased by Avid, you know, uh, you know, he did edit droid. He was the first person to, to, to start doing electronic editing of movies. And he also was one of the first people who got going on software that will do previs, which is the evolution of storyboarding, where you actually do m- movement. You show everything about the shot uh, in a kind of a 3D uh, engine way. So it's, it's like using a game engine to develop your shots. And uh, so he's very creative and very persistent about stuff like that. He's also a terrific businessman. And so he when he, when he got his, his game company going, he just wasn't going to let it go until he sold it. And, and then, of course, uh, Disney, the moment the, the moment the check was signed and the transfer happened, they killed Lucas Farts in, in, instantly and they were smart to do it. Too bad. Yeah. Now, before we conclude our conversation, I have one last question. Sure. What are your plans for the near future? Okay. Well, um, in December, I published my 10th book. It's called Crater Town. And it's a story about the first town on, on Mars, which is populated by a bunch of religious uh, enthusiasts. And, uh, for, you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, to go to a harsh place, you have to have some motivation. It's kind of like the pilgrims going to America and, and, and somehow enduring Boston when you basically are lucky to be alive, you know, and nobody else would do it. Only these disaffected uh, Bank the Church of England people, you know, who came over. And it's kind of like that. And uh, they, like the Puritans who came to America, believe that uh, they left evil behind. But there's been a murder. So that's the story I just I published. And I'm currently working on two more books. I did a children's book a couple of years ago. It's a sort of a subversive children's book. It's not something that I think anybody else would publish, but I did, called Answering the Emperor's Prayer. And it started out, actually, the, the idea behind it was a video game that's never going to get made. And I adapted the story to a, to a children's book. And it's, uh, anyway, so... I'm doing another one and uh, another another children's book. It's also a little bit of sub- subversive. Instead of modern children's books are basically really what the, the theme of, of children's book these days are uh, social inculcation of the values of the present. Make sure they're not racist. Make sure these kids don't grow up to be anti-LBGTQXYZ, all that stuff. And and so I've, I find that either, either very boring or just not the kind of thing that actually sharpens one's own imagination or leads you to think about things in a strange way and how to develop your own character, all those things that are sort of lost from modern books. And so um, I'm working on another one of those. Um, And um, this is, it's kind of about how humans became unpredictable with the help of the moon. And um, it's a, you know, vaguely science fiction-y, but cute. And then I'm also working on a, a novel. Um, uh, it's, it'll be another standalone, like uh, Crater Town. I'm very interested in uh, uh, having traveled quite a bit over the years to foreign parts, and especially in Europe, uh, where you have a coherent culture, where people uh, have a group sense of values that transcends all their laws. And so, for example, if you're in France, um, uh, if somebody says, where were you brought up as a criticism of a kid? Uh, that's, that's accepted. That's, that, that's, that, are you French? You, do you understand? You know, and if you say that to an American these days, that's, uh, that's, uh, out of bounds. You can't say things like that anymore. And, and the, so the multicultural diversity also means that we have a very loose culture full of personal exploitation of each other. And I find it distasteful. And I'm working on a story which is going to be about that. So it's about how Very we, you know, I mean, I guess, I guess to put it bluntly, my idea is that uh, the, the national model e pluribus unum is actually e pluribus fuck you. And uh, that's that's kind of the theme that's underlying the story. But of course, it will have a, it will have a character. And he's a journalist. And... Uh, a colleague, he's a journalist who does online stories. You know the stories online where you, 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 you they, they found a cave with this amazing thing and you go through 25 pages of ads 
and you find out there's nothing really in the cave after all. He, he writes stories like that, but he has a colleague who is a serious journal, journalist and found out uh, something going wrong in the world of short selling big time stocks, how they, how they trick the mar market into getting stocks to dep get depressed so they can uh, make money in shorts. And he, he's uncovering a scam and he gets murdered. So uh, our journalist friend, who is uh, this dopey guy, who's he's, he, he's a kind of black sheep of a wealthy family and uh, who doesn't want to do any of the things that the rest of the family does. And so he suddenly realizes he has to kind of up his game and try to figure out what happened to his friend. And, and of course, all the time he's getting scammed by everybody. So can't wait to read them. OK, well, have fun. It'll, it'll be a few months for the kids' book and a few, uh, another year for the – I'm taking kind of a gap year. I've been turning out a novel every year for about the last 10 years. And, and so uh, this, will, this is a gap year for that. It'll be – the kids' book will be done, I hope. But the other one is, ne is next year. Very well. Well, thank you so much, Hal, for taking the time to join me for this conversation today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, uh, thank you for, uh, for leading it and leading me here and there. It was fun to follow your uh, ideas. Thanks for having me. It was great fun.